John chats with Kendra and Kat. Just a couple of girls talk about this and that. Get familiar with blue and the charmed ones too. Charm chats. Welcome to Charm Chats with Kendra and Kat. Oh man. So we have a bit of an issue with the sump pump. Yep. So if you hear it in the background, I apologize. I but... think it, I think it's been listening to too much salt and pepper. Okay. It's trying to pump it up. All or right. pump it real good. Got it, got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It probably thinks it's spinderella. Yeah, I don't know what it thinks it is, but I think it's annoying. Mm-hmm. So there's that. And again, usual Apologies for any sounds of people walking upstairs or sounds outside that I cannot get rid of. But, mm -hmm. you know. We should be fairly good because home roommate is quiet. Mm -hmm. And roommate who is not home is at Six Flags. Yes. All day. Yay. She is not coming home for a very long time. We might have to let the puppers out. That's fine. We can mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. I figured we would. Yeah. Okay. So we're, hey, we're only starting an hour and a half behind schedule. Yeah, it's not too bad. Yeah, it's about average. Yeah. So we are at episode 121. We're so close to the end. I can uh -huh. taste it. It's called Love Hurts. Mm-hmm. It aired May 19th, 1999. That's, that's a lot of nines. It is indeed. We're going to get a bit of wiki tangenting just because of the title of the episode. The song referred to in the title is Love Hurts, which was written by songwriter Booladoo. Booladoo. No. <laughs> God damn it. And I, I practiced this name, too. Boodaloo. Boodaloo Bryant. Which is you the... forgot the R in Bryant. Bryant? Bryant? No, it's Bryant. Bryant. You said Bryant. I did say Bryant, but hold on. Now I'm going to check it. And we're going to Google. Hold on. This is all going to get cut because now I'm, now I'm, Duh. There's no A. Food. L-E-A-U-X. Thank you. Yes, there it is, is Bryant. Bryant. So I must have just mistyped. Okay. For so leave in my comment about leaving out the R. Okay. Bryant. Mother pus bucket. Okay. I've never seen a bucket of pus. It's not a pleasant sight. So that's a good thing. Well, coming out, it would be fun for me. Just watching it. You're an odd duck. Quack. Yeah. Boodaloo Bryant. Such a hard, it's a Is hard it Boodaloo name. or Boodaloo? Oh. She, she says, making Cat go all the way back to Wiki. B as in by. Boo. Yeah, that's IPA. I read IPA. Yeah. Boo. Okay. See, I don't, so... Technically, it's um because the the last the last letter that's a, a closed oo, so oo so boodalo. Uh, it's it's Code. a it's a diphthong, yeah. O. So boodalo. So I practiced it for like a, literally fifteen minutes. And it's more I like still said it wrong. Yeah, the the u is kind of an uh, boodalo. Here, you can click on it. It should tell you. No, it doesn't. Oh no. Ooh, yeah. Oh, I guess it is a. Boo. What am I thinking? Hang on, go to the last one. D. Oh, code. No. Code. And then? No, no, go to the... The O-U is... Oh! Uh, oh, I forgot that was a unit. Okay. That makes so more sense. So, Boodalo. Yeah. Boodalo. Okay. I don't know how much of this I'm going to cut out. We'll Which is out. exactly how it should be said, because French. Okay, good. So, so. your entire diatribe before we started about it not be sounding like French was uh, wrong. Well, you know, uh, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> okay, Blue. His head is gone. Into my jacket. Yep. We have a pouch puppy once more. Yes. All right. Mm. So. This is as close to pregnancy as I want. This is good. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. that'll last like an hour and a half, maybe. Yeah, this is true. Yeah. All right. So, Love Hurts was written by songwriter, how do we say it now? Boodaloo? Boodaloo. Boodaloo. Boodalo Bryant. It was first recorded by the Everly Brothers in July of 1960. It has also been recorded by American singer Roy Orbison, English singer Jim Capaldi, the Canadian hard rock power trio Triumph, 
and the Scottish hard rock band Nazareth, who did it as a power ballad. Even Cher has recorded this song. Excellent. Mm -hmm. One more qualification she has over Donald Trump. There you go. The Nazareth power ballad version was sung by the lead singer of the Dandy Warhols in a second season episode of Veronica Mars. And the Dandy Warhol song, We Used to Be Friends, is the theme song for that show, and it was their first single. So it became a cult hit because of the show. You know what's happening right now in my head? What? I'm trying to sing We Used to Be Friends to the tune of Why Can't We Be Friends. <laughs> and it's yeah, not no, working. That is, that is a completely it's different song. It's not working. Song. It's making it a totally different show. Yeah, that is completely different. But I love that song. Yeah. Like, I legit, when I first started watching Veronica Mars... I heard that song and I was like, I must own this song and listen to it on repeat for the next six months. And then I did. So, you know, there's that. I've done that. Mm -hmm. Mostly also, with Sarah McLachlan. With what? Sarah McLachlan. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I do that a lot with her stuff, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, a cover of the Nazareth version was sung by Nan Vernon for Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 She's a mm -hmm. Canadian singer who did the end music for both of his Halloween movies. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Yep. There's that, I guess. So, we start with a Golden Gate Bridge shot. And then a shot of Freddy's Mini Mart open 24 hours. And because I was wondering, I tried to look up Freddy's. The only one that I could find no longer exists. But it was in Temecula, California. Temecula. Yeah, I had no idea. Temecula. I had never heard of it. Mm -hmm. So I looked that up. It's about a seven-hour drive south of San Francisco, about an hour and a half south of Los Angeles. So we know where they go for location shoots, I guess. Yep, outside Los Angeles, even though yeah. the show is supposed to take place in San Francisco. Whatever. Yeah. Once, they, once they get all of those, you know, helicopter shots mm -hmm. and trolley all the establishing shots, shots and, and stuff, yeah. They probably spent like a full week just getting all that shit. Probably. Probably. And then they probably have to go back for the subsequent seasons to be like, can we add to our arsenal of trolleys? I think we can. Yeah, I'm going to be really excited when we get to next season to mm -hmm. see what yeah, shots they kept and what honestly, shots they redo. And honestly, they haven't really repeated a trolley shot. Yeah, they have. Like, not a lot of them. They repeat trolley shots less than they repeat normal shots in the show. We have more trolley shots than we have of shots outside of Quake. True. Very, very true. But I think that's partly because there's more trolleys. Well, yeah, it's San fucking Frisco. <laughs> San fucking Frisco? San fucking Frisco. That's a new way Fran of doesn't live there anymore. <laughs> she moved to Queens. No, no, Fran is the tan jacket floral skirt lady. Yeah, she moved to Queens to be a nanny. Oh, Jesus. Uh, anyway. Well, actually, she moved to Queens to work at a hair salon. She got fired and ended up becoming a nanny by accident. Okay. I've never watched that show. Well, let me rephrase. I've watched one episode of that show. Could not deal and stopped watching. It's one of those things that I turn on to shut off my brain. Oh, yeah, no, I have other things for that. Yeah. But I, I find Fran Drescher's voice comfortably annoying you know what i mean i find fran dresser's voice more annoying than janice's laugh on friends yeah i don't know what it is about janice i i don't hate her or anything it's just i i don't i, I just, don't really care like, i don't really i'm ambivalent about janice yeah, I, I, just, the, I, her hmm. yeah her her whole character is supposed to be annoying so i i understand that but i'm just like meh yeah but yeah Friend dresser on the nanny. I I enjoy. And of course the constant bickering between Niles and um the assistant lady. Not a clue because I don't watch it. Mm -hmm. Great. I literally have seen one episode. Niles was in an episode of Star Trek. Okay. He was the holodeck version of Moriarty. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I think this was actually probably before he was on the nanny, because he kinda had a mullet. Like not really a mullet. Like like the Power 90s hair from 116. Okay. Yeah. Gabriel. Got it. But yeah. All right. It's, it was just comforting. Hmm. But yeah, comfortably annoying is how I would describe Fran Drescher's voice. All right. I'll allow it. Mm. Plus the 
the dude who plays the dad, he was in a Disney Channel movie called something like My Mom is Dating a Vampire. Okay. Or something like that. You know a lot more Disney movies than I do. Well, it was my era. Yeah. But yeah. Because <laughs> he was trying to date one of the aunts from Sabrina. Oh, I remember Sabrina. Not Zelda. The other one. The round one. <laughs> well, yeah, they're both the blonde, so that's one. not going to help you. The round one? Yeah. Her face is round. Zelda's face is narrow. Oh, Jesus. I'm not saying she's fat. Because she's not. She is, however, round. I'm in shape. Round is a shape. <laughs> oh, God. Uh-huh. Well, see, now... We Hilda? Have... Hilda? Hilda. Hilda. But, yeah. She played the mom. There were two kids. And on the dating profile that the guy put up, apparently... I don't remember what his likes were, but I think it was, like, kind of, you know, cliche, long walks on the beach at mm-hmm. night and... And then under his dislikes were turtlenecks. Because he's a vampire. Uh huh. <laughs> oh, and garlic. Cute. And they, of course, they're immediately made suspicious by this, but they have to convince their mom, and then I don't remember what happens, but it was funny. Alrighty then. Yeah. I, I might just have to look that one up. It's delightful. Alright. As are most Disney movies, let's face it. Mm hmm. They, mm-hmm. they have some good stuff. Yes. Yeah. Anyway. We come in on a shot of a woman walking really fast to a car, and she's carrying, like, a very small brown bag between her arms, but, like, kind of hugging it, Mm -hmm. and keeps looking over her shoulder. Yep. We'll tangent about her in a minute. She's wearing jeans, a blue shirt, and a white knit zip-up hoodie, Mm -hmm. and her hair... This is how you know that Kendra is reading my notes. (laughs) Well, you didn't put anything about her hair, which I have to comment on, because I can only describe it as classically angelic. Mm. Because it's like blonde and curls, but not like ringlets. Yeah. Like if if she if she used the right product, she'd she'd look like a blonde Shirley Temple. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Yeah, I did not write anything about her Uh hair because I never write anything about the Mm. hair really. It so. was it was very appropriate for who her character turns out to be. Yeah. But, yeah, like, she's trying to get to the car, she gets at the keys, and then she, I guess she's startled by a horn beeping or something. Yeah, car horn So she beeps. drops the bag. Yeah. You hear glass breaking. Thank you, Foley. Foley artist, yep. And when she tries to pick the stuff up, she cuts her hand on a broken bottle, and it looks not really like a cut. No. It just looks like someone it looks used like... a makeup pen to just yeah. draw... On her hand, and it's big. Yeah, it was and then, really cheesy. Like, did yeah. not look right at all. Yeah, and she, it like, bad. she curses under her breath or something. Yep. And, but and then, who who should come up behind her <laughs> but Leo? Leo! He is, this is, this is one of my favorite Leo outfits, just because you're just like, could you put on anything more? He has a red shirt under a white checked button down, and then a tan jacket on top of that, plus his jeans. The and presumably thing, work boots. Yeah, and work boots. The only thing he was missing was a plaid shirt on top. Like, yeah, I know. you know, like. Yeah. And, you know, if this were Star Wars, the fact that he's wearing a red shirt would be a problem. Well, and it kind of is a problem. Er, but why did I say Star Wars? I, I meant Star it. Trek. Yep. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, it's, it's been one long, of those days. It's been a long day. It's all right. I forgive you. you. You said Star Wars because we have a pillow that you made. Except I didn't say Star Wars because of that, because we weren't just talking about that. I said Star Wars because I said Star Wars. I don't... I was trying. I know. You were trying to make excuses for me. Yeah. But honestly, there is no excuse for this. I just fucked up. That's all right. Mm -hmm. But anyway. Yeah, he's wearing a red shirt, and normally that would be funny to me. Well, it is still kind of funny yeah, kind seeing of as what happens at uh-huh. the end of this I'm scene. Thinking, I'm thinking I'm thinking. the uh, the button-down and the jacket kind of negate the red shirt. Maybe. Yeah, possibly. whatever. Also, the fact that he doesn't work on a starship. Very true. Um, I think that negates it yes. more. Yeah. But Daisy clearly recognizes him. And, and is, is very happy to see him. Just relieved, I think, rather than happy. Well, it's she, it's it's. I mean, yeah, she was sure, happy it's, to it's see on the him. positive end of the scale, but it's very yeah. much like a happiness that's mostly relief. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Because she's scared of somebody else. Well, she's on edge. You can tell that already. Yeah. Good body work, girl. Mm-hmm. 
And so Leo holds her hand and, you know, uses his Heals powers that. to heal it. Yeah. And, and, of course, she asks, like, how did you do that? Because she has no idea. He's a white lighter. Yeah. No Apparently clue. even knowing him and yep. the, fact, the fact that he just popped up behind her, well, in the middle of a city when she's already on edge, like, that would worry me. But she clearly trusts him enough. Yeah, exactly. That this is not a problem. And he tells her to trust him because she has a special future ahead of her. Uh, Ding. Who wrote this fucking script? Oh, God. I don't, I'm yeah, not even going to look that up because I don't uh-huh. care. Yep. So he tells her that he has powerful friends who can help her. And we and, know he's talking about the sisters. Yes. And Daisy worries about Alec finding her, but Leo says that he made her invisible to him just as Alec appears wearing all black. And so, now that Alec is here, and look who it is. Let's tangent. Alec is played by Michael Truco, or Trucco, or how you Truco, say it? I think. He's been in a bunch of stuff. So much stuff. Yeah. He was on One Tree Hill, he mm-hmm. was in Battlestar Galactica, and actually, because of the way I've watched Battlestar Galactica, I shouldn't technically know he's in this, because I saw the last four episodes first. Okay, because I've never seen at, it. I was staying at my brother's in California at the time, and he just wanted to watch that, so we watched it. So, you know, I was pretty spoiled for the ending. I and so, never seen like, the point that I've watched the entire... I went back to the beginning and I tried to watch all of it, but, you know, because of Gaius, I can't get that far at a time, because he annoys the shit out of me. Oh, just... Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know that feel. Yeah, he's That will happen to me in this show. Yeah, it's that feeling of... Wanting to change the channel to get back to the other thing you were watching, except it was this show. Yeah. I, again, totally understand that. Mm-hmm. Because that will happen to me in yeah. this show. Yeah, and he was also on Castle. I don't remember mm-hmm. who See, he was on How I Met Your Mother. I never was, watched Revenge. How I Met Your Mother, he was one of Robin's ex-boyfriends. Oh, okay. That, that much I know. Sense. And I remember him from Castle. That's right, how I yeah. knew who I rem- he was. I remember him being on that, too. Yeah. I did not know he was on Grandfathered. Yeah, apparently he is on Grandfathered. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And other than the fact that Michael is his middle name, his first name being Edward, there's not a whole lot of interesting stuff about him, really. I know he's been in more things that I've seen him in. Oh, yeah. He's been in a bunch of stuff. But Mm -hmm. I just picked the the things that most people would know him from. Yeah. So Daisy is played by Lisa Robin Kelly. She was born March 5th, 1970 in Southington, Connecticut. She died in her sleep on August 15th, 2013. She was 43. She died in a rehab clinic where she had checked in just days earlier. Aww. Yeah. Most people will know her from that 70s show where oh, she yeah! played Lori Foreman. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I thought yeah. she looked familiar, but I couldn't place it, and it didn't bother me enough to check. Yeah. She played Lori Foreman, and during filming of that show, she developed her drug habit and was fired during the third season. Her character was explained away by sending her to beauty school. They did bring her back for the fifth season, but after a couple of episodes, she was replaced... Because they put her character into a key storyline and couldn't write her out again. Her replacement was Christina Moore, who was born April 12th, 1973 in hey, Palatine, Illinois. She shares a birthday with Shannon. Yes, she did. Oh uh, my god, Palatine, too. Yep. I lived in Palatine for a few years. It's a boring town. Boring ass town. So boring. Anyway, Christina Moore was on the 90210 reboot show. She was on True Blood. She was on Hawthorne as well as a bunch of one-off episodes of things. She's still acting and has three movies coming out next year. Three? Three. Why did you not write them down? Because they didn't really. They're in post-production. So, for anyone who's curious, those actually technically four movies, one is coming out this year, the rest are coming out next year. The other one this year has no date, Are, in chronological order, Searching for Fortune, Running Wild, Dirt, and Stuck. There you go. Don't know what they're about, but it's okay. No idea, but there you go. Mm-hmm. So, because I'm me, I looked it up. There are 11 other people on IMDb who list their birthplace as Palatine, Illinois. Two of them had pictures, so those are the two that I actually looked at. Taylor Marie Hill is a Victoria's Secret model who just started modeling for them in April of 2015. She was born in 1996, and that makes me cry a little inside. Oh my gosh. Does it make you cry for you or for society? Yes. <laughs> the only other person born in Palatine with a picture is John Lee Brody. He oh, you know what should make you cry more? She's 20. Yeah. I, well, I mean, like, sometimes you look at the the birth date, and it doesn't really hit you. You're like, 96, that's so recent. And then you stop, and you're like, 
That was 20 years ago. Yep. Yeah. 20 years ago? Yep. I was 15 when she was born. It's mm-hmm. kind of terrifying. So John Lee Brody has an interesting face because his mother is Korean while his father is German. Mm. His full descent list is Hawaiian, Korean, German, Swedish, and Native American. It makes for interesting bone structure. This is true. He's had bit parts in Star Trek Into Darkness and Furious 7, and he was one of the businessmen in the first episode of Leverage, though he was uncredited. Oh, nice. Yep. Do you want to see what he looks like? Yeah. You described that lineage to me, and how can I not? Ah! His eyes are a little close together. Fascinating. But it, it makes for an interesting bone structure. You left out Jewish. Well, it's German-Jewish descent. I mean, it's, you know... Well, one doesn't necessarily but Jew indicate doesn't, the other. Jew doesn't make bone structure. So? That's why I left it out. Because I didn't care about the religion aspect. I was talking about the bone structure. Well, it's more of a cultural aspect. But again... Still, I think it's worth noting. All right. My God, he went to William Fremd High School? Apparently. Well, he... Yeah. Oh, he was one of those uh, three sport athletes. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, I had to go to the award ceremony for the athletes for my brother, mm-hmm. his senior year, and he was a three sport athlete the entirety of high school, which is very difficult to do. Mm-hmm. Because first you have to get into three sports, and you have to make sure they're sports that don't happen at the same time as each other. So you know, one in the fall, one in the winter, one in the spring, and. No one knew he was a three-sport athlete. It's a very small club at my high school. Because a lot of athletes, they'll do one, two things. Like, if you're a swimmer, you'll probably do water polo. Okay. But then what are you going to do for the third thing? Oh, uh, who knows? And he's, like, at the end of the line for the three-sport athletes. And they're like, it's like, you didn't do three sports? And he's like, yeah, I did. Swimming, water polo, cross country. And they're like, oh, fuck, you're right, Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. Good shit. Very cool. Yeah. My high school's cross country team is kind of notorious. In a good way. Okay. Because we've apparently won so many championships. But just the guys. Hey, you know, it happens. Well, from what I've heard, because I knew a few girls who were in cross country, apparently the girls' cross country coach would try and work them in the exact same way as the guys. Oh, see, that doesn't work. No, it doesn't. Like, doesn't come work. on. They're not guys. They're not going to be guys. Some of them might be up to that, but, you know, what works for girls isn't always going to work for guys, and if you try and make them fit all into the same mold, guess what's going to happen? You're going to have a 2016 election. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wait. Won't that be over by the time this that is published? Will. Oh that my god. Indeed. Not that it matters because we've both voted, but yeah. we will definitely have everyone will have voted. Yes. And we will know the outcome. Oh my gosh. Ah. So if we if we want, we can insert outcome here. Outcome. Uh, let's just fuck it. Hillary's president. <laughs> that, yeah, my my I my hope and my prayer is that she is that she is. I've so. done everything I can to make that happen. You've done everything you can to make that happen. Exactly. We've also done everything we can to make sure that Tammy Duckworth goes to the Senate because fuck you, Mark Kirk. Yes. Um <laughs> kick Kirk to the curb. Um Yes. Absolutely. Which don't don't spell curb with a K because then that's a problem for the hashtag. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, don't spell it the British way. They spell it with a K? K E R B. I never knew that. Yep. And they're called trunk of boots, but that's yep. about it. Yep. Well, that's not about it. Oh yeah. But they, yeah. they spell tire with a Y. I kind of like that. Uh, that when I that that's I'm, that's I'm actually that's much, actually very much closer to Middle English, though. Yeah, I'm very much an Anglophile, but there are some words that I just can't do. Okay, well, when you realize that adding the U was a conscious decision made on the part of linguists, as yeah. well as adding a B to debt. Yes. Well, you realize that the reason that the British added the U to their words, it was because the Americans didn't. Like, the yeah. the Americans didn't have the U, and so the British were like, well, they're not going to, you know, do this. We'll just add this, and then we'll be better than them. That, and they wanted to get closer to French and Latin. Yeah. And I'm okay with it. 
I like the way that the words look with a U. It is nice. Mm, it just looks prettier. I don't know. <laughs> I'm weird. I, I remember Stephen Fry telling a story about going into a subway in the UK and there was an ad, thank you, Blue, on the wall. And I think it said something about color, but there was no U because it was an American company. Mm -hmm. And so someone just put a carrot and a U <laughs> and said, I think something like, spell it right, you cunt. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Like, I'm okay with that kind of graffiti. That's funny. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wow. All right. So, back to wiki tangenting. So, while looking up people from Palatine, I wanted to see who was listed as from Skokie, which is my hometown. You really went above and beyond with this wiki tangent. I did. I did. And there's a reason. We because you will want, come for it. Because you want the episodes to be more than two and a half hours again? No. Trust me, you'll you'll see why when because I, I went on I a tangent. Sure, I will. I Let went, me guess. Is it charmed? No, no, it does not come full circle. Damn it! To that, at least. You okay. know I love circles. I know, especially when they overlap. Yes, because then they make pretty Celtic patterns. Like, oh, I don't know, a triquetra. Yes. Anyway, so I wanted to look up people from Skokie, which is my hometown. There were only twenty four names, but that's way more than I thought there would be. Mm -hmm. But there were a couple I was about of... to say, only 24. Hey, you know, there were a couple of names missing from the list that I thought would be there because I know of at least two people from my hometown who are now famous. Mm -hmm. But I looked them up and one is being listed as being born in Chicago and the other has no listing at all. So what can you do? You know. Call the Ghostbusters. Okay. The two people that I know from Skokie is Jonathan Kite, who mm -hmm. plays Oleg on Two Broke Girls. Right, yeah. You and mentioned him in a previous episode. I have indeed. And Ronnie Kroll. Right. Who, you mentioned him as well. Yeah. So that's why I didn't bother writing them in my notes because I've already mentioned them. Go back to whatever episode that happened in. I, I think it was only remember. two or three episodes ago. I honestly don't remember. I think we were in this position when we were doing that. I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. No idea. I'm sure you, dear listener, will be able to figure it out. Yes. So, of all of the people listed with Skokie, Illinois as their hometown, I had to bring up two. The first is Jenny Schramm. She's been in a bunch of stuff, including Veronica Mars, Mad Men, Falling Skies, and Once Upon a Time. And if none of that is true, it's a Schramm. Yeah, no, it is true. But okay, I, I get where you're going with that one. So you're welcome. The other one is named Bobby Caraldo, and the reason I bring him up is because of what he was involved with. He was a writer, producer, director, animator. And art director for, pause for dramatic effect, what, what, in the butt! <laughs> Blue popped his head out of my jacket. <laughs> Hi, Blue. Don't be alarming you. I'm sorry. But yeah. Anyway, what, what, back in the butt. Yes. I legit, I, because I just was like randomly clicking on things. You need like, to watch oh, the South Park version too. Yeah, we'll get there. It's, it's pretty spot on. But I legit saw that, and I was like, well, now I have to bring it up. Yeah. All right. So, since I've now tangented a lot, and we're not even past the first scene, let's get back to the show. Mm -hmm. Alec, who has appeared behind, like, over by the street corner, mm -hmm. says hi to Leo, and asks him where Daisy is. Leo, of course, tells Daisy, you know, without looking at her, that Alec can't see her, and she better fucking hoof it. Yep. And very smartly, she decides not to take the car. Yep, she just which runs would away. Have been, which would have been... Hilarious. It would have been... Hilariously hilarious. stupid. Yeah, it would have been... Because she might be invisible and Alec can't find her, but I think seeing a car door open up with no one holding it would kind of tip him off. Yeah, a little bit. And I'm very glad they decided not to do that, even though, like, clearly it's her car and she's now got to, like you know, find some other way to get around. Well, but I think it was a rental. Well, yeah, it's a rental, but still, yeah. like, you gotta take it back to the rental place, hey, if you nothing know. else. I mean, granted, like, that's not high on her list of priorities, I'm sure. But, yeah, very true. But yeah, she runs off, and Alec tries to call out to her and tells her he loves her, but yeah. of course, she's already gone, and he doesn't fucking know that. And apparently, yeah. he also knows about Piper. Yeah. Which... How? 
I don't know. know. We don't know how dark lighters and white lighters also know each other. Correct me if I'm wrong. Do we ever see a dark lighter ever again in you the know, show? You know, I honestly don't remember, but I, I don't feel think like so. maybe once. And if I'm correct, it's in the third season. And yeah, I know I this because that's know. where I learned the word sartorial. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, maybe. I could be wrong. It could be something else. I want to say that one was a dark lighter. Other yeah, than I that, know. I have no fucking clue. Yeah. But so we learned that Alec is a dark lighter. Mm-hmm. And Leo says that dark lighters aren't capable of love. Yeah. So, so that's a thing. you know. But we also learned that all Alec had to do was think about Daisy and he'd be there with her until Leo cloaked her from him. Well, he's a bad dude, so, you know, I'm on Leo's side over here. Absolutely. This this episode is one of those where if you've been in an abusive relationship, it might be a bit triggering for you. Mm-hmm. See, now, I was super into this episode as a kid. I would just, I would, I would use the word titillating okay. to describe it for me because, you know, I was 13-ish okay. watching it. So, I don't know what it was about this episode, but it really did it for me. It might have just been the guy who plays Alec. Maybe. Or the the thing he says later about ice cubes. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. That's right. I condensed that bit. But, you know, I was I was a weird... I had weird stories as a kid, so... Hmm. I would have been sent to therapy much earlier <laughs> if, you know, some of the drawings... That had ever been shown to my parents. At like you know, five, I probably would have been sent to therapy. I was doing some fucked up shit. I don't know where I got it. Don't know. Like, I had this entire story about with my Barbies because I had like the three little baby Barbies. And yeah, there was, there was kidnapping, there was incest, there was rape, there was murder. Wow. And I made this up when I was like four. You got a fucked up childhood. I know. My childhood was nothing but rainbows and daisies and stuff. Sunshine, compared... lollipops, and rainbows. Yeah, compared to yours. Yeah. See, and I don't know how I knew what any of those was. Because hmm. I was four. Mm-hmm. Meh. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so this episode I really liked at the time. And now rewatching, I'm just like, I can connect to my memory of it, but I also know it's fucked up. Yeah, this episode has yeah. a, a bunch of fucked up bits. Uh-huh. For sure. Yeah. But it's it's got Leo in it, so you know it's, it's a good Leo, one. It's got Leo. You know. And it's a, and it's an important part of Leo's story arc. It's important. It's an important part of It's important. <laughs> it's important. I thought that though. <laughs> it's an important part of everyone's storyline. True. This is I think one of my favorite it's episodes. It's a Keystone episode. Yeah, there we'll we'll get to more reasoning later, but there is there's a lot that happens in this episode mm. that makes me very, very happy that this was one of the episodes they yeah. did. I would classify this as being an important episode a la that 70s episode, mm-hmm. where the plot itself and certainly the script may have needed a lot more work in mm-hmm. order to actually be considered good, but they are still foundational episodes for this show. Mm-hmm. So, I like, we don't actually have any really fillery episodes in no. the show right now. I think there... I think we might later, but... Yeah, there's a few fillers when we get into later seasons, but for the most part, they did really I, good. You know what? I kind of feel like the Alcatraz episode could be classified as filler. Kind of. Because it's not... Because it's not Piper important wasn't for, there. Yeah, well, it's not important for all of the sisters and... I mean, other than, you know, with Andy's storyline, it doesn't have a lot of impact on their world. True. Mm-hmm. Very and true. Honestly, though it I does... don't know that they ever told Piper what happened. No, I don't think they ever did. But I do think that it did bring a little bit more... Yeah, yeah. It was between, good for Between P- Prue Phoebe and Phoebe. And Prue. Yeah, because they, they got to stop being so bitchy at each other mm-hmm. and learn to work together. And so that was nice to see. Yeah. True. But we're on this episode now. <laughs> and so. all of that work from last episode has unraveled. Yeah, a little bit. Uh-huh. But, you know. Anyway. Anyway, so. After after Leo telling 
Alec that he's cloaked Daisy from him. Mm -hmm. Uh, Leo says, Alec won't find Daisy as long as Leo lives. And Alec's like, bitch, I got got a a fixer for that. Yeah, I got a solution for that. And in a puff of black smoke appears a crossbow. Uh And he shoots Leo in the shoulder. Yep. As Leo is orbing out. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we get Leo in in light white Orbeez and... Yeah. And smoky bits and whatever. Mm-hmm. And we get a panning exterior shot from the second floor of the Halliwell Manor. And Prue and Phoebe are walking down the stairs. Phoebe is in a black jacket, white pants, and a pink top with a porthole neckline. It's AKA not... cleavage window. Yeah, it's not quite a boob window, but it is close. Because it's not low enough down. We don't actually see her boobs. It's just at her neck. Well, line. she's short, so it works. Yeah. But we do see the outline of her bra, so that's something. We know she's wearing one. Yeah. But we though, don't worry about Phoebe wearing bras. True, though later in the episode, even with the bra, we still see her nipples. Well, yeah. So, you I know. I mean, that's, that happens. Yeah. All the fucking time. Yeah. The only reason we keep commenting on it is because when Prue does it, It soups obvious. Yeah. Prue is in a black jean jacket, a dark red wrap skirt with pink trim, and a dark red bikini top. Because apparently the girls are going on vacation to Cabo, which for those who don't know is Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. I did not look up anything about it. Good girl. Okay. Phoebe thinks that Prue wearing her bikini makes Phoebe look frumpy. Which is a sign of the apocalypse, yeah. she says. It was very funny. And, and Prue learned... apparently had to beg the guy in accounting to lend them his condo in Cabo. And she's looking forward to getting golden, golden brown, brown on, on the, the beach. beach. Yeah. Phoebe, of course, is looking forward to some new male blood. They both want that new male blood to be tan and buff. With limited, limited verbal, verbal skills, skills and, and no, no strings, strings attached. attached. Hang on, didn't we do this like hey, uh, twelve episodes ago? Yeah, a little bit. Sorry, Still, no, not twelve. Fourteen. Yeah, fifteen. It was, 15. it was a while back. Fifteen. It was like episode two. Yeah, it was like a while back. No, it was episode five. Okay, it was a while again back. with your horrible memory. Yeah, horrible memory. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Phoebe says, Stella, we're getting our groove back, (laughs) which is a reference to the 1998 romantic comedy How Stella Got Her Groove Back, which is based on a 1996 book by Terry McMillan. Her 1992 book, Waiting to Exhale, was made into a movie in 1995. Cool. Just thought I'd put that out there. Mm. They go to high five, but they miss, which I thought was hilarious. Yeah. And then they just head over to the dining room. And it wasn't... Like, it was a scripted mess, and you can tell. Oh, yeah, but it was still funny. And as they stand in front of the staircase, we can see that Graham's picture isn't there. It's back to the original sepia randomness, whatever. But it's like, why? Why? I don't know. Graham's photo isn't there anymore, which is fine by me, because the, the frame and everything, it really didn't look as good. Yeah, I don't know. It looked kinda tacky. Honestly, I like, I like how, because it was such a huge photo. It was a huge photo. I just don't understand why they felt the need to put it in that one episode and make it feel like, oh, it's been through the entire time. And then I wonder if Jennifer Rhodes is just like, oh, come on, that's a horrible photo. No, just put the old thing back. Just put the old thing back. Yeah, I don't know. No idea. Whatever. Whatever. It doesn't matter. So we get the getting our groove back line. And then Phoebe asks where Piper is, and Prue says that she's going to be in a groove-free kind of mode for a while. Because apparently she's taking a vacation for men. Mm-hmm. Which, how many times have we been on that storyline? Hey, you know... Um, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So, Phoebe, of course, then wants to know what she's going to be doing while they're partying on the beach, and Prue says that Piper's in the attic searching for a suitcase to carry her books in. I have one of those. It's in my room. Piper's my kind of girl, yeah. you know? Except that she's reading, according to Prue, the kind of books they make into Kevin Costner movies. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not my kind of book. I enjoy mystery novels. Mm. I enjoy fantasy and the occasional nonfiction about linguistics. Hmm. I like mystery novels because I can usually figure out who done it. Well, yeah. It's a function of the book. They're supposed to make you figure it out just before the main character. No, no, no. But I usually figure it out toward the beginning of the book. Well, yeah, because it's formulaic. Like, way before. I had that problem with TV shows, too. Yeah. 
No, that's my favorite game to play while watching, like, Castle or... No. CSI or no, NCIS. No, or... SV, Law and Order. Yeah. Because it's... 90% of the time, you will see the killer or the whodunit or whatever within the first five minutes. And it's usually the first person they talk to. Not always. But usually. Less often than you think. Didn't. It is It is quite often, but it's more often than lupus on house. True. Because that's only happened, like, twice. Where it actually was lupus. Yes. The problem that I have with most cop shows is that you know who the bad guy is because it's one of two things. It's either the first person they talk to, and then we kind of forget about them until the very end, because they never talk to them again until the very end when they realize mm-hmm. they're the bad guy. Or it's the most famous person in the room yeah, playing the bad guy, because yeah. it's like, oh, we know him from other things? Okay, he's the bad guy. Yeah. And it's really kind Unless of Unless you're dealing with Doug Jones. Well... Because yeah. every time he's been on a procedural, he's not been the one. True. I mean, he was in two episodes of Criminal Minds, and he wasn't the dude either time. Very true. I love Doug Jones. Oh my god, yeah. Hmm. We've covered that quite yeah. a lot. We have. So mm-hmm. let's get back to the show, shall we? Yeah. Prue and Phoebe kind of joke back and forth a bit about Piper's love life mm-hmm. before, from upstairs, there's a thump and a, sc- a little scream, like a startled shout coming from the attic. Yeah. And Piper yells for them, so they, they run upstairs. But, okay, so they take off toward the attic. Like, they start off running. But by the time they get toward the attic, like, up the stairs, they're just walking. Slower than you'd think that they'd walk after what they just heard. Yeah. Just saunter into the thing, like, into the attic. Like, uh-huh. like what's going on? Do to do Like, I just don't understand why they yeah. weren't more... Energetic. Maybe like they, they were, were a second maybe they're ago. hoping Piper got buried alive by her books a little bit. <laughs> and Possibly. then they they thought maybe leaving her there for a few seconds longer would make her not want to bring them. Possibly. But anyway, they walk yeah. in and there's Leo lying on the floor, clearly in pain, with an arrow stuck in his shoulder. Mm-hmm. And they all just kind of stare at him confused. And we end on a shot of him groaning in pain on the floor. And everyone looking shocked. Mm-hmm. And while we're at it, let's say what Piper's wearing. Yeah. Piper is wearing dark gray pants and a blue top that has a diamond pattern at the neck and at the stomach and on the arms from the wrist to the elbow so that it matches up with the stomach mm-hmm. portion of the shirt. And sometimes when it catches the right light, it looks like it's actually a texture instead of a pattern. Yeah, a little bit. But I, it, was a, it was a good yeah. looking shirt on her. It looked nice. Mm-hmm. And then we go to the opening credits. So... The post credit song on the DVD is Human by the Pretenders. Or by Pretenders. There was no the. I don't know. Isn't there a band called the Pretenders? Yeah. Yeah. So, so a different band? I don't know. I honestly have no idea. You mean of all the things you wiki tangented, this yeah. was not one of them? No, because I didn't care enough. And that'll, that'll, yeah, I didn't care enough. But this song was originally called Human on the Inside and was recorded by the Australian rock duo Divinals. I touch my sail. No. Yeah. Isn't that it? No. Didn't they do I touch my sail? I, I don't. I'm pretty I, sure they did. No idea. Hang on. No idea. You can look that up because I did not bother. I'm the shit. All I know is it was released by Divinals in 1996. So there's that. Yep. Okay. Sure. It's not a song I know very well, so... Mm. Yeah, they did I Touch Myself. Okay. Anyway. Which, honestly, I know the most from Austin Powers. Oh, yeah. All right. So, the song on Netflix is Insecurity by the band Girls Love Shoes. And yes, that is the real name of the band. Yeah. Oh, and the album it's on is called Super Medicine. (laughs) Yeah, not super, super, with an A, and it's one word. It's from 2009. But I think this may be the first time ever that I kind of like the Netflix song better. That's your prerogative. Yeah, I just, I don't know. It was more, like, upbeat and happy sounding. Because that's what you want for this episode. No, but I'm saying, like, it was a a nicer song. Did you hear it at all? Did you? Yeah, because I watched this on Netflix. Oh, you didn't watch it on DVD. And no, my DVD was having some skipping issues, so I just switched over. That's sad. Yeah, I know, and they're new. Yeah. 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 But yeah, I I just, I kind of enjoyed the Netflix song Mm -hmm. better, and I think that's the first time. But yeah, the band is Girls Love Shoes. 
dear. You know, whatever. So we get a Golden Gate Bridge shot that pushes into the skyline, and if anyone is taking a tally for me, we do see the Triangle Building in the distance. Mm -hmm. Then we get cars driving on the bridge, and we get a shot that we have never seen before. Oh no, what is it? It's a streetcar turnaround. Oh dang. I love it. Oh dang. Yeah, so that brings our streetcar total up to 25. And then we get a street shot, and we see a streetcar coming down the hill, bringing our total to 26. Ooh. Yep. And then we get a shot of some random people crossing the street, and then rush hour on the bridge, which has a ton of vehicles, including a truck carrying tree trunks. <laughs> it was a little odd. And then an exterior shot of the manor. And we see Prue running around and getting bandages and all sorts of stuff out of the bathroom. And she has a moment where she tries to close the drawer, but it wouldn't shut. And so she makes this little like sound of frustration. I want to know if the drawer not closing was supposed to happen or if it was just a thing that happened because she also had a moment of like missing the edge of the mirror when she went to open it. Like mm-hmm. she went to grab it and missed it and had to grab again. Yeah. It was kind of funny. Also inside the medicine cabinet mirror, we see a box of Tampax brand tampons, which was the first thing that caught my eye because of the brand name. But next to it is a box of Tussin, which made me think of that Chris Rock comedy rant that he did that year. Mm-hmm. It's, I'll, I'll put a link to that on the website. He swears a lot more than we do, so just forewarning you. Okay, so back to the show. We cut to the attic, and Phoebe and Piper are carrying Leo to a chair. And Piper is a bit upset that Phoebe knew Leo was supernatural but didn't tell her, and Phoebe says that she did tell them, they just didn't want to believe her. Which, if we remember back, this was in the attic when Phoebe tells her exactly what Leo is, and Prue tells her that she should write children's stories because of her imagination. Mm. So, Leo, of course, starts to say that he wanted to tell her, but Piper shuts him down, and Phoebe says that they have to get the arrow out, but Leo tells them not to touch it because it's tipped with poison. Luckily, Prue is back. Oh, yeah. And she just kind of, like, pushes her hand from one side to the other, and it mm-hmm. goes forward through the rest of him. Yeah, so the and fletching, into the wall. Yeah, so the fletching goes through his body. Now, the tip had poison on it, but it wasn't barbed. Wouldn't it have been less painful for them to pull it out the other way? Or did Possibly. they just not want the, t- the poison tip to go through him again? I don't know. I think they just wanted to have Prue remove it. No, no, I get... I understand Prue removing it because don't touch it, whatever, but... They pulled the fletching through his body. That did more damage. I don't know. I don't know. I'm a no-no. I'm a no-no as well. I really wish this was a video podcast sometimes, just so you could see the hand gestures. Anyway, so Phoebe explains that white lighters are sort of like Tinkerbell minus, minus the, the tutu, tutu and, and wings. wings. Yeah. And that they, they guide in, witches and future white lighters. Mm-hmm. And then Piper gets a bandage and pushes down on Leo's wound, and he cries out in pain, which Piper takes is just, just a, a little, little, yeah. little too much happiness in that. She's she's, she's like, oh, did that hurt? Sadistic. Good. And I was yeah. like, oh my god, Piper! Like yeah. seriously. Mm-hmm. But then Leo tells them about Daisy and says that they have to protect her from the dark lighter because dark lighters seduce innocent women, and their goal is to create evil through reproduction. Because of course it is. Uh huh. Phoebe, of course, quips that it's Generation 666, which is kind of funny. But according to Leo, Alec broke his own rules and fell in love with his target. Well, he broke the rules. The arbitrary rules that have been set. Well, no, I'm saying his own rules because, you know, Leo technically broke the rules by falling in love with Piper. Well, yeah. And so Alec has kind of done the same thing in the opposite direction and fallen in love with not a ward, but, you know, a target. Yeah. And Daisy apparently loved him back. Mm Mm-hmm. And Leo tells Piper she's got every right to be mad at him. And she, she kind of thanks him for the permission. Yeah, well, she does it very snarkily. Yeah. She's just like, thanks for the permission. And goes to get more gods. I'm going to go get more gods. Yeah, it was just, it was like in that moment of like, thank you for mansplaining. You know? Yeah, right. Like, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, Leo's like, guys, you really got to find Daisy before, yeah, she's, he's begging before to Alex find her. does. Otherwise, she won't be able to come become a white lighter, which... Yeah. I don't understand that reasoning. Like, has she not done all of the good she's... If she's already marked to be a white lighter when she dies... Right, but if Alec takes her, she like, won't become a white lighter because 
Because she'll have evil baby? Yeah, possibly. That sounds stupid. Yeah, but you know... I'm a no-no. Meh. Whatever. We don't, we don't understand like the, the reasoning behind it, but there's a lot of stuff that comes up in the show that you're yeah. just like, oh, okay. Sure, that makes sense in some dimension somewhere, I'm sure. Yeah, evil. This is one of those things. Corrupting, innocent yeah. young woman. Like, yeah, I don't know. Can we, but I think it's because I mean, if she like goes trouble. with him and and you know decides to be with him, she becomes evil, and then wouldn't become a white lighter. She'd become a dark lighter. I'm assuming. I honestly have but no idea. But if they do it through reproduction, then the kid would be a dark lighter anyway. Yeah, I no idea. Whatever. No clue. No clue. Anyway, he doesn't know where Daisy is, but, you know... Leo he does tells, tell them the, the last place that he saw her yeah. was at a Mini Mart in the Castro. And Phoebe's like, well, how the hell do you vanquish a dark later? <laughs> and Leo is so unhelpful. He's just like, just don't, don't let, let them touch, touch you. you because yeah. his power's in your hands. And when he chooses to, he can have the touch, touch of, of death. death. Yeah. But he's like, dude, we got the power of three. Tells Phoebe to call the airline, cancel the tickets, mm-hmm. while she calls Andy to see if he can help locate Daisy. Right. And Phoebe's like, I'll talk to Piper about staying with you, Leo. Yeah. It's kind of funny, because you knew that Piper was going to be the one to stay with Leo. Mm-hmm. Because they're the ones that have to be together. Yeah. So, the only way to advance their storyline is to make sure like, they get quality time. Yeah, exactly. Cut to police station via exterior shot. Yep, exterior street Andy shot. Daryl at their desks. Andy has on a blue shirt with a red tie that has yellow lines on it that sometimes look like eagle signs. We have seen this tie before. I remember mm. this tie. Daryl is in a purple shirt with a reddish tie with like a wavy pattern on it. He really looks nice in purple. He's so nice in purple. Yeah, he looks really good in purple. Neither of them has their jackets on because, you know, they're inside and sitting at their desks. They don't need them. And we don't see their pants. So we don't know. Mm. I'm assuming black pants, but that's just because 90% of the time... Black Either pants. black or gray. Yeah. Occasionally brown. Every once in a while. So, Daryl asks if Andy is enjoying the silence treatment and the cold shoulder, and we see the IA dudes in the room behind him, so of course we assume that's what he's talking about. But apparently Daryl is talking about them, because he still doesn't know what IA is after them. Mm-hmm. The phone rings, Andy answers it, and Pru immediately identifies herself, but Andy, of course, can't let the cat out of the bag so yeah. he pretends it's Franklin from Forensics. Yeah, and of course after he hangs up, Daryl calls him out on his lying because mm-hmm. Franklin's wife had a baby girl the day before and so he took the week off. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, was he calling you from the maternity ward? Like, it was kind of funny yeah. and kind of just like, god damn it, Andy. Yeah. I mean, the the yeah. whole like way he was carrying on the conversation was pretty convincing. But they just had to have the convention of Daryl knows shit's up. Yeah, exactly. Even if the IA dudes don't. don't. Yeah. So Andy, of course, then gets up and he puts on his jacket. It's dark gray. Daryl is fine with Andy wanting to keep secrets as long as he doesn't lie to him. And we get this interaction where Andy just straightens his tie, nods, pats Daryl on the arm, and then walks away. And Daryl just kind of shuts the door on the room that the IA guys are in. Like, fuck you. Yeah, just like, okay, I'm done with this. And it was a very funny moment, because you're just like, you realize that these guys have been working together for a long time. Mm -hmm. And they are friends. And so, it's it's just nice to see how their relationship is still growing. Mm Mm-hmm. So, it's it's nice. But then we cut over, we get an exterior shot of Quake, and we see Tan Jacket Floral Skirt Lady walking in. And then, inside, we pan through the bottles at the bar, which includes what looks to be some sort of champagne and a bottle of Hennessy, which I thought was kind of funny, plus a few bottles of Joan Soda and a bottle of Sobe. With so, the gecko. Huh? It's got a gecko on the bottle. Yeah like a little lizard. Now, the liquor makes sense, but why is the soda there? Is it so I can tangent about Sobe and Jones? Apparently. Well, it is now. Yep. Okay. So, Jones Soda Company is now based out of Seattle, Washington, but it was founded in 1987 in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. In 96, they came out with seven flavors in their 12-ounce bottles. They had orange, cherry, lemon, lime, strawberry, raspberry, and grape. 
And over the years, they have come out with many different flavors of soda, including bacon. I've tried that. Mm -hmm. They also have a few sugar-free sodas, which include the delicious cream soda. I love their cream soda. I will put a link to their wiki on the website so you can read about all of the interesting flavors because they have a lot of weird shit and I'm not going to go through it all. But as for their labels, they use black and white photos as a marketing ploy to create a quote-unquote emotional attachment to the brand. They have a database of over a million pictures that people have submitted over the years. In 1999, they came up with My Jones, which meant that people could customize their own 12-pack of bottles with whatever picture and message they wanted. One of my friends did that for her wedding. It was super Aww. cool. It was super duper cute. They had pictures of them as kids and pictures of them from like their engagement photos and stuff like that. It was super duper cool. And then in 2006, they announced that they were replacing high fructose corn syrup in all of their products with pure cane sugar. And combined with trying to launch their sodas in cans, lost about $11.6 million. Because no one wanted to drink it out of a can. No. Like, honestly. The point is the bottle. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, it, wasn't, it wasn't the corn syrup thing. No. Granted, cane sugar is probably a little more expensive, but, you know, yeah. they'd be willing to take that loss if it would get them good PR. Yes. In 2008, they were still losing money, so in order to save $2.6 million a year, they downsized 42 employees. Now, just to give you a reference of how small this company is, that was about 40% of its workforce. To 100 employees. Yeah, it's a tiny, tiny workforce. Oh, and the company motto is, run with the little guy, create some change. And they don't have any TV commercials or magazine ads. They focus instead on word of mouth and product placement. So that's why they're in this show. I know Panera carries them. Yeah. So I, I think they're probably, like, back in good standing financially. Yeah, I think so. I think so. As for Sobe, the name Sobe, capital S, little O, capital B, little E. All one word. All one word. Is an abbreviation for South Beach, which is a place in Florida, which is funny because the company was founded in Connecticut in 1996. Yeah. Yeah. They are now owned by PepsiCo, who bought them in 2000. And they had a short-lived soda back in 2002 called Mr. Green. It was tinted green, and it had ginseng in it. It was kind of gross. Yeah, I bet. I remember it. I tried it. It was kind of gross. So one of the products that Sobe used to have was called Adrenaline Rush. And in 2007, Sobe sponsored the Chicago Rush, which was an arena football league team. One I've never heard of. But then again, I don't know much about sports ball. That's fine. They were around from 2001 to 2013. And they played at Allstate Arena, but I've already talked I about that. I know Chicago Fire is the soccer. Yeah. But so because Sobe sponsored the Chicago Rush, and they had a drink called Adrenaline Rush, the dancers became the Sobe Adrenaline Rush Dancers. Because why okay, not? Okay, whatever. Yeah. So, but arena football is still a thing. It's been around since 1987. I'm not much for sports, so... I had no idea that it was really around. However, one thing that's interesting that I did note is currently there are only four teams in Arena Football League. Hmm. Yeah. It's a very they small are, league. It's a very small league. Uh, I, at their height, I think they had 19. That's still a very small league. Yeah. So they are the Tampa Bay Storm, which has been with the AFL since it started in 1987 when they were originally known as the Pittsburgh Gladiators. They were relocated to Florida in 1991 and were thus renamed Tampa Bay Storm. Then you have the Cleveland Gladiators, which joined in 1997, the Philadelphia Soul, which joined in 2004, and the Washington Valor, which is the newest team that was founded just this year and will be joining the league next year. Hmm. They have never had two consecutive seasons in which the league has had the exact same lineup of cities. Oh, no. Yeah. I will leave a link to the wiki page on the website for anyone who wants to read more about it for themselves. As always, I found it was a fascinating read, but I have tangented a lot and we're, you know, yeah. not very far in. So let's continue. 
So someone grabs a couple bottles off the shelf and we see through the shelf to Prue and Andy sitting at a table. Prue is now in a green dress that has a very busy pattern on it in shades of like green and yellow. Mm -hmm. It's low cut in the front and high cut in the back, but I'm not sure if that was by design or intention. Okay. Like, I don't know if it was I just... Were, I thought you were talking about the hem. No, the the neckline. Mm-hmm. Because it's a spaghetti strap, but it has, like, a double spaghetti strap, one in green and one in yellow, and there's a trim of yellow lace at the bottom. Mm-hmm. But, like, I just... The the front of the dress was, like, low down, but the t- the back of the dress was high up. But I don't know if that's just because they made it lower in the front for her, so they pulled it up a little in the back. Or if it was supposed to be high. Like, I just, I don't know. It was, it didn't look odd. It just was a little weird to me. Yeah, my response to that is, I'm a no-no. There you go. I love that I'm a no-no is now a thing. Yeah. I'm a no-no. Mm-hmm. So, Prue asks what's going on, and Andy tells her about the IA guys looking into all the cases that she's been involved in. And Prue's like, oh, do you think they followed us? Which, you know, he doesn't put it past them. But... She wonders also if Andy's going to tell them about her, but he assures her that while they may follow him, that he won't tell her secret. Mm -hmm. And after a little more back and forth, Prue asks Andy about finding Daisy, and she tells him what he needs to know, and he says that he'll do what he can, and then she thanks him, and they smile at each other, and we jump over to the attic with no establishing shot. Phoebe is now carrying a tray with some food on it and wound cleaning stuff for Leo. It looked like it was a sandwich and some strawberries. It was a little odd. <laughs> a little weird. She also makes a joke that she wasn't sure if he actually ate, which I thought was kind of funny. It's like, bitch, you've seen him eating yeah. sandwiches. Like, you remember when it was, hey, look, so-and-so's on TV. Like, yeah, he was eating two huge sandwiches. Yeah, but, you know. You've seen, you've seen him eat. Yeah. Oh, Phoebe. She crazy. Yeah, yeah. Leo asks about Piper and Phoebe's like, oh yeah, she's uh, dealing because, you know, not every day you find out the guy you're seeing isn't human. Although, Although in Piper's, Piper's case, case. Yeah. She does this little adorable little eyebrow yeah. raise. It was super cute. Mm-hmm. And Leo's like, oh, I wish she didn't find out about me like this. Yep. And then he, and then he says, the best Leo line of the episode. Being with her broke the rules, but not being with her breaks my heart. Yep. I love that line so much. I kind of want it as a poster. Anyway. Phoebe says that she thinks Piper understands about the little secrets that they have to keep because it's not like they rushed to tell him they were witches. Leo then asks about Daisy, and Phoebe fills him in on what little they know before she pulls off his bandage and he winces in pain. She apologizes for that, and she's like, dude, why aren't you healing yourself? Didn't you tell me you can heal yourself? And he's like, no, my powers for others. I can't use them on myself. Yeah. And then he coughs. It looked super painful. Yeah. Good acting, right? Yeah. Good acting. Like, it... Ugh. Mm-hmm. But apparently, a dark lighter's poison cannot be reversed mm-hmm. because it's meant to kill white lighters. Yep. And it's only a matter of time before he kicks that adorable handyman bucket. <laughs> yeah. And when he dies, he won't be able to cloak Daisy anymore. Well, he he says that his ability to cloak Daisy is already waning. Yes. Uh-huh. And Phoebe is kind of just like, oh, well, we, we gotta get you better. Like, well, we'll yeah. do this. We'll save she's you so, both. She's so uncomfortable yeah. with the thought of Leo dying. And if Phoebe is that uncomfortable about it, you can only imagine how Piper feels. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. But Phoebe is, of course, trying to make light of the situation. Yeah. Make but she's like, you know. of the situation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> She's, you know, we're, we're going to save you both. It'll be fine. Mm-hmm. That kind of thing. And then we cut downstairs where Piper is flipping through the Book of Shadows. And Phoebe comes downstairs and we can now see that her pants have an interesting button detail on them. Yeah, it's like it's like a front upward flap. Like if they were two, three inches higher, they would be like a kind of a more modern now style where they're like kind of bringing it in the 70s. Again. Yeah, it was there was five buttons at the waist and then, like, three buttons down each side. Yeah, kind of, like, outlining where you would put pockets. Yeah, it was... It wasn't, like, odd, like, oh, that looks weird. It was more odd in that, like, there's no fly in the front of the pants. Mm-hmm. So that, like, you don't... I, I didn't... We didn't really see the back of the pants, so we don't know if there was, like, a zipper at the oh, back. There's probably a zipper. Yeah, but it's, like, it was just completely a flat panel at, at the front. Yeah. And it was just... It was a little odd. Yeah. Like, not a bad odd, just an odd odd. 
Yes. An yeah. Odd Thomas. An Odd Thomas? Oh, it's a book series from Dean Koontz. Oh. Uh, okay. Not an author I know very well. He writes mysteries. I'd like it. Okay, good to know. So yeah, Piper is upset because she's not finding anything in the Book of Shadows about how to help Leo. And Phoebe tells her that she needs to accept the possibility that Leo might not be the innocent that they're meant to save, that only that, Daisy is. Yeah, and Piper is having none of that yeah. shit. And she tells Phoebe that they have to save Leo whether they're meant to or not. Yeah, so with a closes, lovely tinge of anger in her voice. Yeah, so she closes the Book of Shadows and just walks away. And then we get a, a little insert of Leo in the attic glistening with sweat and like breathing all funky. Mm-hmm. Which is funny, because that shot, that single shot, is the worst he's looked all day. Mm-hmm. He'll actually look better than that next time we see him. Yeah. It was a little weird. Yeah. So, then we cut over to an exterior shot of a building with the signs Hotel Senator and Senator Hotel on it. <laughs> Small tangent. So, the Senator Hotel was in operation from 1924 to 1979, It was a nine-story, 400-room, Italian Renaissance-style hotel in Sacramento, California. That's about a two-hour drive away from San Francisco. It is located at 12th and L, across the street from the California State Capitol building. Fun fact, President Gerald Ford spent the night at the Senator Hotel before the September 5th, 1975 assassination attempt on him by cultist Manson family disciple Squeaky Frome. It was an attempt because her gun didn't actually fire. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Her story is fascinating, but I don't want to talk about her. So link to her wiki page on the website. Back to the hotel. Although the Senator Hotel was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in May of 1979, the hotel was closed two months later and shuttered with panels placed over the windows. The structure was then renovated and reopened in 1983 as an office building under the name Senator Hotel Office Building, because nobody has any vision, giving lobbyists short walking distance access to California's state politicians. It was listed for sale in 2012 and was bought at an auction in 2015, but nothing's been done with it that I'm aware of. Okay. However, the shot they show doesn't seem like it's the actual building, but I looked for pictures of the building and none of them looked even remotely close to the shot they show us, so I have no idea where the building that they show us is actually from. Okay. Yeah. I could not find that anywhere, and I literally looked for half an hour. Yeah. But the hotel senator pictures that I found looked nothing like this little rinky-dink hole-in-the-wall, kind of look like a crack house, (laughs) you know, little tiny little hotel thing. So I don't know where that was. Could not find it. Could not tell you. Whatever. Back to the show. So Daisy runs into a room And the camera is doing this, like, shaky thing that was hurting my head. Why do shows do the shaky cam thing? Like, it's not tension building. It's just nausea inducing. I wish they'd stop it. I don't like it. But whatever, this one's from, you know, many years ago, and so I can't stop them. Yeah. But but they do it now, too, and it's just, I can't. Mm -hmm. But it's, like, from this upward angle that seems like it's in the corner of the ceiling. Yeah. And you get this downward angle of her walking to the, like, dining area table mm-hmm. of this, you know, hotel room and setting down whatever bag she had because apparently she's always grocery shopping. <laughs> yeah. And then she turns and you can see on top of the TV is a vase full of mostly white couple red daisies. hmm And this is apparently very alarming for her. And... Pops Alec yep. behind her saying, I got you your favorites. Yeah. Because he's a fucking creeper. Yep. And he misses this. Us. Us. Yeah. He misses them being a couple. And she, of course, tries to tell him that they're not a couple and begs him to stop. And Alec, in textbook perfect abusive relationship wording, says, You're mine. And then describes one of their happier moments, which is apparently when Daisy first said she loved him. And apparently this involved ice cubes and broken air conditioning sitting out on a fire escape, rubbing them down each other's necks, backs, 
I wanted him to say pussies and cracks. <laughs> yeah. Which, okay. They would not have done that in this show, but I understand that that logic. Jump. But, yeah, every time I go to my chiropractor and someone says, your neck, your back, I I have to stop myself. <laughs> every time. <laughs> Yeah. Every time. Yeah. It's difficult. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. But yeah, there's this bit where he repeats the exact words she said to him. Yeah. And you kind of get her voice. Forever, in. Alec. I love you forever. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's certainly creepy. Yeah. It's always creepy when, when you see the bad guys, like, mimic... Yeah, it's the, it's it's always weird to people. see a voice come out of someone's face when you know it's not their voice. Yeah, unless it's like someone doing um, an impression. That yeah, that's different. Yeah, that's different. But this was most definitely like he was using her words against her literally, mm-hmm. like in her yeah. own voice and everything. Yeah, she and then, she picks up the vase off of the TV, throws it at him, and, and totally misses. misses. Yeah, by a by a lot. Yeah, the way they kind of frame it. I guess they tried to make it look like it was much closer, so they yeah. kind of did it on an angle. But it smashes into the wall behind him, mm-hmm. and it's at least she was at least a foot and a half off. Yeah, and he's it was not bad. that far away. It was super bad. Uh-huh. Like, yeah, there's a lot more of him just you know gaslighting the fuck out of her. Yeah, it was and a lot a of manager, abusive relationship. Wording. A manager knocks on the door because apparently. He has super hearing and can anticipate when a vase is about to break. Yeah, I don't know why he shows up at the door. I don't know. There could be any kind of reasons, you know, a la convenience. It's an absolute a la convenience, that's for sure. Daisy's like, no, I'm not going with you willingly. You're never going to fucking make me. And he's like, then I'll never go away. Yeah. So the manager's like, okay, guys, I'm coming in. Yeah. And Daisy's like, no, stay away. But Alec walks over to the door, and the manager walks in, and he just kind of grabs him by the neck, and mm-hmm. then turns to Daisy, and... And basically is like, you're making me do this. Yeah. And then and his hand glows red. And we we see, like, kind of wavy air in front of the manager's face. It turns a little red, and then suddenly these black splotches appear on it. Yeah, he burns up super yeah. bad, and it's it yeah. looks super painful. And then he falls to the ground. And yeah. you, get a, even get you get a, a shot. You get a shot of Daisy like running out. Yeah, she climbs out the window, which I thought was kind she of funny. Climbs out the window onto the fire escape yeah. and runs away. But this is where, and then the manager collapses to the ground. Yeah, and then Prue and Andy come running in. So yeah. this is where my thought process was. Doesn't Prue he, doesn't he Andy. say that thing about like you can't run from me? Yeah, yeah. Um, she is. Yeah, she clearly can. Again, she's not a paraplegic. <laughs> yes. But this is where the, the manager coming to the door makes me think, because Prue and Andy show up, like, nigh instantaneously afterwards, mm-hmm. that there was the possibility of Prue and Andy were like, hey, we think this is going on. Could you, that you know, go to, go, you know, meet us at the at the room? And the manager preemptively opens the door. I'm, I think I'm that's just, giving the show a little too much credit. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware. Because, but, honestly, that's not Prue's M.O. No, it isn't, but... Like, she's she's one to just kind of barge in. Yeah, but, like, you know, figure out what the cops, room they're in. Like, so. you know, politely ask, Hey, I'm here to see, like, my cousin or my sister, Daisy. Could you tell me what room she's in? Yeah. Aww. And then the manager will... Exactly. Thank but. you, Blue. And then the manager will be like, Oh, yeah, it's room, like, 203. And then she's like, okay, thanks, bye. And then just, you know, waltzes on upstairs. Yeah, I, I get that. but I, I could just... see Andy maybe doing that, but he knows it's supernatural, so he'd probably follow Prue's M.O. More likely. Yeah, I honestly don't know. Yeah. But anyway, they walk in through the open door, yep. and Alec tries to go to the window, but, you know, he sees people have come into the room. And so Prue, like, flings him into a mirror and a lamp. Yeah. And then Alec realizes what the fuck is up. Andy's, like, pointing his gun at the dude. <laughs> and then he, like, turns kind of, like, blue, uh, like, black with a blue outline. Yeah, like, he kind of glows does, blue for a does, second. like, negative orbs. Yeah, he, he turns into, like, black smoky orbs and he flies out the window. And he's <laughs> like, what the hell is that? And Prue's like, welcome to my world. Which was cute. Yeah, it was kind of cute. And then we go to commercial break. And we come back to an exterior shot of the Halliwell Manor. Phoebe enters the attic and she's hearing rhyming as Piper is reading a spell out of the Book of Shadows. 
Apparently she has found a power switching spell and she thinks that if she and Leo switch powers, she'll be able to heal him. Prue then comes in and asks what's yeah. going on. And Phoebe has a great line of, you know, the usual. Made, made some, some coffee, coffee, read the newspaper, walked in on Pyre, switching powers with Leo. Yeah. Prue wonders if it's safe, but Piper doesn't care because she needs to save him with or without their support. And she's like, I would like the support of my sisters when I cast this spell. And Mm -hmm. Prue's like, cast Cast away. away. (laughs) Which kind of made me laugh, but the movie didn't come out until December of 2000. Oh, you need to watch the David S. Pumpkins. I did. Oh my god, I love it. I I watched it this morning because I I saw the Haunted Lover thing and I didn't realize that was where the David S. Pumpkins thing came from. Oh my god. Yeah, I watched the entire haunted elevator thing. <laughs> the Ugh. skeleton backup. Yeah, I love it. David S. Pumpkins. What? He's got a middle initial now. Yeah, and apparently the jacket that he was wearing—you mm-hmm. can actually get it at Spirit Halloween. It's the Bone Daddy jacket. Oh my god. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah. Piper so, says the spell, which goes like this: What's, what's mine is yours. What's yours is mine. Let our powers cross the line. I, I offer up my gift to share. Switch the powers, powers through the air. And then there's a very light whooshing sound. Yeah. Right when Phoebe asks, "Did it work?" And then, a la convenience, Kit runs in. Hey, look, they still have a cat. Yeah, and I haven't and, seen her in for fucking ever. But you know, yeah. Piper turns to her and tries to freeze her and can't. And so she's like, "Well, must have worked." Mm-hmm. And so Prue's like, "Oh, okay. Well, then Phoebe and I." But when she puts her hand on Phoebe's shoulder, she has she a gets a premonition of a lamp shattering. Yeah. Just then, Kit jumps on the table where the lamp is. Phoebe yells at her, puts her hand up, and makes the lamp fly against the wall and smash. <laughs> Smashy smash. So we have decided that lamps count as decor, not furniture, so our FAQ, the Furniture Annihilation Quotient, stands at four. Yes. And they realize that it wasn't just Piper and Leo whose powers got switched, and Piper's like, am I about to get yelled at? And then <laughs> so crew does that thing with her hands where she's like, you switched all, all of, of our powers? powers? Yeah. And, and Phoebe's like, oh, Supernatural Freaky Friday. Yeah. But see, here's my question. Do they not remember the whole truth spell thing worked for everyone that was in the house? Why did they not think the switching powers was going to work for everyone in the house? Don't know. I just... But that didn't... Meh. It, I mean, this is just, you know, for, for funsies and for character development. Because you have four people with powers in that room. Mm-hmm. There was no way to control who was going to get, get whose power. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was no way at all. Yeah. Yeah. The phone rings, and Phoebe leaves to answer it, telling them, you better fucking sort this by the time I get back. Which, you know, is kind of funny. Uh uh-huh. And so Piper walks over to Leo and just kind of stands over him and does her, like, hand motion. Like, okay, heal now. <laughs> and then after two tries, she turns around to Prue and holds her hands and is like, why aren't these working? <laughs> It was kind of funny. She's getting very frustrated. Mm-hmm. Prue, but- Prue grabs her wrist and she's like, honey, you have to, remember when you first got your powers? Like, you mm-hmm. had to find a trigger. You have to find his, his trigger. Because Piper's, Piper's yeah. like, I'm just doing what I always do. And she's like, yeah, that's not going to work. Yeah, not so, so much. So Phoebe comes back in and tells him that Andy found Daisy because she bought a bus ticket. Mm-hmm. And so they have to go find her before she runs away. Phoebe, so- of course, is eager to switch their powers back, but Piper's but Piper like, not, it. Yeah. not until I fucking heal Leo. Yeah, no one's going to stop her from healing Leo, mm-hmm. and I understand and, that. And Prue's like, we don't even have time. Yeah. So yeah. you, like Phoebe and I, will go get Daisy, and Piper stays with Leo. And we got to an exterior shot of the police station. That pushes into the sign for extra dramatic effect. Because of course it does. Yeah. For some fucking mm-hmm. reason. Andy walks into a room with the two IA guys. They're both wearing blue shirts and black pants with blue ties, but they have different shades and patterns. You know, in case you cared. The IA guys ask him why he was at a crime scene before a crime had even been reported, because apparently he's the one that called in the manager's murder. And he kind of shrugs, and he's like, I got a tip. Yeah, but they don't believe him, and Mm -hmm. they say that witnesses placed him at the scene with a woman, about 5'3 or 4, brunette and attractive. Wasn't Prue wearing heels? So she should have been taller than that, because Shannon is 5'4. And in heels, she should have been taller. I don't know, maybe they detracted the heels? Maybe, but I don't know. 
Andy says that he doesn't have to reveal his informants, but Rodriguez says that in an IA investigation, he doesn't have the same rights as he does in court. He's big dogging him. Yeah. And Anderson, you know, wants to know who Andy's covering for. So Andy, like, takes a beat and yeah. then stands up and puts out one hand to be like, okay, dudes, chill. Mm-hmm. Pulls his gun out of, well, pulls the, the, the gun holster out of his, like, whatever, yeah, whatever belt harness thing. thingy. Yeah. And sets it on the table and then puts his badge next to it. And he's like, says, screw, screw you. you. And walks out of the room. Yeah. They room were not expecting that. Yeah. They were not expecting that. And they look a bit worried. Mm-hmm. It's kind of funny. Mm-hmm. And we cut to a Greyhound bus depot. Yep. Tiny tangent, but only because I thought it was super interesting. So Greyhound has been around since 1914. In Minnesota, and we really mean around. Yes, <laughs> yes. It was in it's in Minnesota. It was founded by a guy named Carl Eric Wickman, who was born in Sweden in 1887. In 1905, he moved to the United States, where he was working as a drill operator in a mine in Alice, Minnesota, until he was laid off in 1914. Later that year, he became a hop mobile salesman. In Hibbing, Minnesota. Now, Hupmobile is a car. It's okay. a super duper pretty car. I, I suggest checking out the wiki for it because they, they're just super pretty cars. So he proved unable to sell the car. In 1914, he used his remaining vehicle, which was a seven passenger car, and began a bus service with Andy Anderson, known as Bus Andy, and CAA Heed, who went by Arvid. Because, you know, 1914, what you going to do? They transported iron ore miners from Hibbing, Minnesota to Alice, Minnesota at 15 cents a ride because Alice had the best saloons. (laughs) I just thought that was hilarious. So there is a link to the wiki. It'll be on the website because there's a lot more about him that people might find interesting. But yeah, I just, I had to share because it made me giggle. Oh, those are those cars. Yeah, they're super pretty. Yeah, those, like, from the Annie movie. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're super duper pretty cars. Yeah. Yeah. The, sh- the kind of shit you'd see on Downton Abbey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, Seriously, people. Google Hupmobile. H-U-P-M-O-B-I-L-E. Yep. Yep. One word. Super Ooh, duper look. pretty. Yellow car. Yes, yellow car. And they have some, like, older models that... Also look really, like, it looks like they go, I, the aesthetic kind of stops around the 50s. Yeah. But it doesn't really change all that much. Mm-mm. Yeah, they've got, like, the little running board on the side, and, like, the mm-hmm. like the extra spare tire thing is on the side mm-hmm. of the car. And the, the vents on either side of, the, like, it's one of those, the hood on the engine block kind of folds up on mm-hmm. both sides. Yeah. Like, there's a hinge along the center. Yeah, they're super cute. So... We see Daisy. She walks up to a counter to ask where to find her bus. And the guy behind the counter turns around. And and it's it's Alec Alec being all stalker ex-boyfriend. And says some stupid line about, you can't, like, I'll always find you. Yeah, I think it was I'll always find you or something. Uh Yeah, And so she she walks off off quickly. And as she's walking, bumps into a mail carrier who turns around. And it's Alec again. He's like, dude, I'm in no hurry. I've got forever. Care, Care to, to join, join me? me? Yeah. Fuck no. Oh my no. god. I just... Urgh. Yeah. So apparently he's, you know, kind of fucking with her. It's not that he actually is all of these people. It's just that he's making her think he is. Yeah, I honestly don't know if it, he's just fucking with her brain or if he's actually taking over those people or there's no real explanation at all. But we then cut to Phoebe and Prue entering the bus depot. Prue keeps poking Phoebe, trying to get her mad, because that's what first triggered her ability. Yeah, and Phoebe's like, well, my buttons aren't that easy to push. Yeah, so and she Prue remembers up. from high school that <laughs> high school Phoebe got game. caught behind the bleachers make- macking on someone, Yeah, and she was trying to remember the nickname they gave her. Yeah. And she <laughs> and Phoebe <laughs> keeps, like, trying to be like, you're not getting it, you're not yeah, getting it. Yeah. And then Prue like, drops her hands and goes... Oh, yeah. Freebie. Freebie. And Phoebe turns around and puts her hand up to, like, and then <laughs> this magazine her rack. Back. This magazine rack just spins and all the magazines fall off. <laughs> and Prue seems very happy with herself, but now it's her turn. Because they need to get a premonition and they need to get one fast. But Prue is not keen to get another one because apparently she gets woozy. Mm-hmm. But she tries by touching a chair 
And nothing happens. A chair that someone has just vacated. Yeah. So she gets dejected and thinks it's useless. And as she says so, she places her hand on the counter and she gets a premonition. <laughs> Except the shot that they use. Like, she walks up to the counter and she's clearly, like, it's a it's a medium shot, so you see, like, her upper half. And, mm-hmm. and she clearly turns to put her hand on the counter, but then you see the hand and it's just, like, a perfectly cupped hand. <laughs> just lightly touching down yeah. on the counter, not just like, hey, I'm going to grab this fucking counter. Like, But yeah, she gets a premonition of Daisy in the bathroom, like next to a paper towel dispenser. Yeah. Just now, kind of see, cowering against the wall. Hold on. But see, I have a question. We know that Prue's trigger is anger. Mm-hmm. Or at least it was when she first started. Frustration, anger. Right. So Phoebe's premonition trigger was Energy. feeling useless and dejected? No, no, no. No, that was not the point. The point is that because she has to touch stuff, she has to touch stuff that is related to whatever was going on. Granted, her first premonition was just of the couple of guys, so it wasn't really touching anything. Yeah. It was just the situation that triggered it, but that was her first one. And True. every pretty much every other one has been triggered by something. Like, the even even when she was trying to create a premonition she still had to find objects that she thought were going to have an event related to them mm-hmm. to touch hence yeah, i just piper's thought it was airplane ticket like yeah. maybe she'd have a premonition of piper meeting a cute guy on the airplane maybe she'd have a, a premonition of piper's luggage getting lost like it could have been anything, anything she yeah. didn't know what but, i just thought it was but funny the point that is she has to touch something that has an energy associated with it and it's it's tough to look for, you know, a specific thing. So actually, Prue's a way ahead of the game mm-hmm. because she knows how it works. And, you know, granted, Phoebe's still trying to work on making it work. Yeah. But I just thought it was funny that, like, the second she's like, this is useless. And then she touches something and that's when she gets the premonition. It was just. It was, it was a little comic timing. Phoebe's trigger isn't emotional. It's very much physical. Yeah, I guess so. And when she's in the right frame of mind, she can probably call on it a little more easily. But there has to be an energy with whatever she's touching. Yeah, I guess so. And when it people are in trouble, funny. when people are in trouble, there is more energy mm-hmm. already. Yeah. Though it was funny that Prue finishes the vision. She goes, "Does it always make your ears ring?" And Phoebe just nods, mm-hmm. like. Yeah. Yep, pretty much. So I, I like how they do this in the show, showing that it is a physical thing for Phoebe, and that, you know, the others have never realized how much it actually takes out of her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the premonition was of Daisy in the bathroom, so we cut to the bathroom, where Daisy is trying to calm herself down. And, and Alec, Alec appears. appears behind her. Yeah. And, and he does this really oh, fucking weird move, where he, God. he puts his leg, she tries to walk along the counter, and he just puts, puts his, his leg, leg up, up, so his shoe is on the counter. Oh, no. I he just, just, uh... Yeah, I just I and there's mm, some more like not you know, happy about it abusive guest lady talk like yeah you know you Along made me with, kill that guy because you, you wouldn't, wouldn't come, come with, with me, me. if yeah. you just come with me he'd be alive yeah. and so she like Daisy, knees him in the yeah. stomach or possibly the crotch it looked more like the stomach though I think it was meant I think to it was, look like the crotch but it didn't really it and he stomach. grabs her he's he's pissed so he grabs her by the throat at which point Prue and Phoebe enter the bathroom. And he throws Daisy toward the wall to deal with them. Yeah. Prue and Alec have <laughs> words. words. Well, because she's like, I, you know, this is the ladies' room. And he goes, this is a private conversation. And I'm just like, not really? in the ladies' room, it's not. Like, really? Yeah, like, no, public that's facility. not how that works. Yeah. But then his crossbow appears. Mm-hmm. And Prue's like, Phoebe, go. And so Phoebe waves her hand. And, and all, all of the soap, soap dispenser squirts soap out and the water comes out of the taps. And, and, and Alec laughs and so did I. Oh, yeah. And it was just hilarious. And Prue's like, Phoebe, now would be a great time to get angry. Yep. And, and then Alec quips that he's never used his crossbow on a witch before. And I'm like, oh, that lens coming back. Yep, absolutely. And Prue turns to Phoebe and has, a la convenience, enough time to... To tell, to remind Phoebe about the time when Prue dented Grandma's car and yeah. Phoebe got blamed for it. Yeah, with, again with the calling her Grandma. It's just weird. Mm-hmm. It's weird. But at any rate, this pisses Phoebe off enough that Alec flies, flies. into one of the uh, cubicle stalls. Yeah, it looks like the handicap stall because we didn't see a toilet. Uh-huh. So I the, think they probably didn't want to deal with him smashing one. Yeah, probably not. But the way that the the layout was, it looked like there was it was the possibility. Mm-hmm. 
and of, she, a, of a handicap Peter turns to Prue and she's like, I got grounded for that. Yeah. She and then Prue mad. goes to prick up the crossbow and she's like, I've never I'm, used one of these on a dark later before. So yeah, I was yeah. right. Yep. Yeah. So she shoots an arrow at him, but then he turns into dust and orbs and floats away. Because she had to quip. Absolutely. And the arrow lands in the wall next to the toilet seat cover holder thing. Mm. But there's a little continuity error because as we see his orbs float away, we don't see the arrow in the wall. Like, we don't see the fletching of the arrow. There is a black spot on the wall where the arrow should be, but it was there when he stood up before she shot the arrow at him. Yeah. Yeah. So... Phoebe's like, Daisy, Leo sent us. We are taking you to him. And then they leave. Yeah. So we get a nice exterior shot of the manor. It and pans Piper, up. It was quite nice. Yeah. And Piper is still in the attic trying to heal Leo. And they have a little tender moment where he tells her that when he dies, he wants her to know that he wants to be with her and that he loves her. It was a really sweet, tender moment. Mm-hmm. It made me tear up a little. And uh, I will admit. And then we go downstairs where Prue, Phoebe, and Daisy come in. And Daisy sees the vase of flowers on the table, which is a pretty good mix of flowers. There's a couple daisies in there, but not many. Yeah, no, not many like at all. like roses and carnations and shit. Yeah. And, and it's she, she, thinks that, out. she thinks they're from Alec. And she's like, oh, no, he's found me. And Phoebe <laughs> picks the note out of the thing and reads it. And she's like, oh, honey. No, no, these are for Prue. Yeah. <laughs> And they're from Andy. And, and Phoebe's like, is there something wrong with his phone? Yeah, it was kind of funny. So Prue tells her that it's a long story. And then she worries about leaving them alone. But Phoebe reminds her that she's the one with the active power now. So Prue should go. And she leaves. And then Phoebe and Daisy take their jackets off and leave them on the hall table. Because, you yeah. know, why not? And they go to check on Leo. They so cut, cut to, to the, the attic. attic. And we see Piper sitting on the floor, wrapped in the blanket, Rocking, rocking herself back, back and, and forth. forth, yeah. And as they walk in, Phoebe tells Piper that they found Daisy, and Piper tells them that Leo is dead. I think she uses that he's gone. Yeah. But, you know. And then we get a commercial break. A nice push in, too, on that one. Yeah. And when we come back from the commercial break, we have an exterior establishing shot of the manor, as Daisy and Phoebe are running down the stairs, because Daisy's trying to run away again. Daisy and Phoebe are, are talking are yeah. back and forth about her, about Daisy running away. Yeah, and then and Piper comes down the stairs. Well, well, like, Daisy's clearly internalized a lot of the shit that's been happening around her. You know, like, Alex got into her a little bit, and she's like, all oh, this is my fault. All these people are dead because, because of, of me. me. Yeah. And she's like, I can't let anyone else die. I have to leave. And yeah. Piper has come down the stairs, and she's like, fuck you. No, you don't. Leo brought you here. He died to bring you here. You are not leaving, bitch. Yeah, if, if you leave, Alec's going to find you anyway, and then Leo's death will mean nothing, so you're not going anywhere. Yeah. But see, here's my question. Why does she think running is going to work? It never has, but, I know, just don't understand that logic. I, honestly, that entire bit was just to show Piper with a backbone. Oh, After well, this yeah. tragedy. That yeah. was that was That was it. Yeah, I just, I just don't understand the, the point, I guess. Because I just, I don't, like, she knows that Alec's going to find her no matter where she goes. And especially if Leo isn't around to cloak her, all he has to do is think about you when he's there. It doesn't matter where you go. So I don't understand the running away. I really don't. But whatever. We cut to Andy sitting in a seat swing that's attached to a tree. And Prue walks up to him and sits down. This is apparently... The same spot they used to go to in high school. So it's been around to, for a while. To mac on yeah. each other. Although, honestly, like, a, a, a bench swing, not good for fucking. No, but I don't think they were having sex on the swing. Probably not. No. No, that would have been behind Maybe the Maybe some bleachers. light petting. But, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, you could, get, you could probably get a bit of heavy petting down. Yeah. But, you know, it is out in the open. True. So we don't, like, all we see is the tree and the swing and whatever. We don't see anything else. We don't know what else is around it. But whatever. So Andy tells her that he's turned in his shield, which apparently means he's on suspension. Yeah. He says this and throws a stick. Yeah. (laughs) And then he tells her to watch her back in case Rodriguez comes to her to try to get to him. He's like, we probably shouldn't be seen together. We don't want anyone to connect the dots there. Yeah. Because, you know, every one of the unsolved cases that he's trying to track down is an innocent life that she and her sisters helped to save. Prue Prue apologizes apologizes. Yeah. But he reminds her that she taught him that everything happens for a reason. 
which is my favorite phrase, my, my favorite cliche, because it's so true. Everything does happen for a reason. Mm -hmm. But then she kisses him on the cheek, thanks him, and gets up and starts walking away. And he tells her to take care. And then we cut back to the attic. Yeah. Because you can't stay in one place too long. Mm -hmm. And Piper is standing in the doorway to the attic watching, thank you, Blue, watching Leo when Phoebe walks up and they, mm -hmm. they talk for a bit and Piper's clearly angry at Leo for not showing her how to make his power work. Yeah. She's like, all he had to do was tell me and I yeah. could have saved him. Like, you and Prue got to talk about how you did, how your powers worked. Yeah. But and you know, he didn't, so powers... he, must, he must not have wanted to stay. Yeah, but Phoebe tells her that he did want to live and he didn't want to leave her. And then she grabs Piper's hand and says, it's hard to lose someone you love. And then, and then we, we jump, to, jump to a little while later in the attic. And like suddenly we do a, it's night. Yeah, we do a time cut yeah. thing for some reason. And Piper is now sitting by this little couch crying and telling Leo she loves him. And as a teardrop lands on her hand... Her the hand starts to glow. Well, the teardrop starts glowing, and then her hand starts glowing, and she's like, fuck, I found it. Yeah, she's found the trigger. Woo! And so she, she like, clearly there's some setup where there's, like, a line and an LED in her shirt. Yeah. Up to her hand. Yeah, because the, the and glowing she on the top of the hand is CGI, but the glowing underneath is practical. Yes. Yeah. And so she, like holds her hand up but is not like moving because she doesn't want to twist it to yeah it's very to disrupt the it's light. very much a stiff arm movement yes and she like puts her hand next to leo's face and kind of like draws her index finger down she's like leo i love you do you hear me leo i love you do you hear yeah me? she keeps repeating herself and then she, she like him. lets her hand just fall on his chest mm -hmm. and then he gets um, some color back in his skin and he wakes up yeah, he calls her name and they hug. And you get to see some of his lovely upper back freckles. Mm hmm. Because he is topless. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And she's so, like, Why didn't you tell me love was the trigger? And he's like, You had to you find, had to find out, out on your own. your own. Yeah, which is kind of obnoxious. And then he asks her why she couldn't tell him that she loved him. And she said that she was afraid to tell him because she thought it would hurt more if she lost him. So she apologizes and he says, better late than never. Because, you know, <gasps> was he be dead for like three hours? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. He was dead before the sunset and then it was night. Yeah. Like, well before the sunset. It was, like, mid-afternoon. Well, we don't or get actual evening. times in this episode, but... Yeah, so he says better late than never, and she laughs a little, and they kiss, and they hug again. Then we cut to a little while after that, and Piper is helping Leo down the stairs, and he is now in a gray t-shirt. And Phoebe's super surprised to see him up. Uh-huh. And... But Piper's like, there's no time to explain. And... Leo knows that Daisy's been out of the cloak too long so Alec can find her, and Piper wonders where Prue is since, you know, they need to find a spell to vanquish the Dark Lighter. And Leo says, a power of three spell, which is kind of hard to do since Leo has Piper's power at the yeah, moment. Yeah, and they never discuss it. Nope, They're just they like, never... oh, it's a power of three. I guess because, you know, the powers technically belong to the three girls and the fact that they've switched with other people doesn't make them not the charmed ones. Yeah, I don't get it. I honestly don't get it. Uh-huh. Whatever. Whatever. But uh, Phoebe is trying to call Prue on her cell phone. Or she uh, thinks about calling Prue on her cell oh, phone. Yeah. I don't think she actually does it. She just talks about doing no, it. No, didn't she pick up the phone? Am I thinking something else? I honestly don't remember. I, th I, just, I think she I know that she phone. says, oh, I think she has her, her cell on her. Yeah, and she goes to pick up the phone, yeah. but then Alec appears... With, with like, a little dark the, the smoke. The negative orbs. Yeah, but the smoke looks like they piped it into the room a bit as a practical effect because it looks like it was coming from just off screen. Uh -huh. It was kind of funny. Yeah. So Phoebe tries to use Prue's power, which succeeds in making the chandelier above and behind Alec pop and, like, flame out. Yeah, like the light bulb smash and then the chandelier falls to the ground. So Alec grabs Piper and is like, oh, you have what I love. Now I'm gonna take what you love. Yeah, he tries to make a trade. But Phoebe puts her hand up like she's gonna do something. And, okay, so every time Phoebe tries to use Prue's power now, she it's it's like she's trying to throw something. Yeah, it's kind like, of funny. Like, overhand throw. Like, we see them do this with potion bottles later a lot of the times where they just, like, have tiny potion bottles and just fucking throw them at shit. Yeah. Um, and that's what things. it looks like. Because, you know, Prue kind of uses hers, like, with hand waves. Mm -hmm. And Phoebe doesn't want to do that. Yeah, no. But, you know, whatever it does, it works. Yep. She's just, she's she's bad aim. 
Yes. But so she puts her hand up and Alec warns her not to and his hand starts glowing and he says that he'll kill Piper if he has to. And Piper is like, fuck you, bitch. Yeah. And then Daisy tries to get him to stop. Prue comes in, she opens the door, and Alec pushes Piper into Phoebe, grabs Daisy, and Leo yells out, and then Prue's like, Phoebe, stop him! But Alec disappears into smoke and orbs with Daisy and goes out the open door, and we get the last commercial break of the episode. Yep. When we come back, we get an exterior night shot of the manor, and in the living room, Prue is sitting in a puffy floral... I don't know if it's a chair or it's a couch... It's puffy and it's city. floral. Yeah, I don't know. But Phoebe is sitting on the arm of that same piece of furniture. And Piper and Leo are sitting on the floor next to the coffee table. Mm-hmm. Piper is trying to use Leo's power to try and find Daisy. But she's frustrated because she doesn't think she can do it. And Leo's and, trying to encourage her. But yeah. he's like, wouldn't it be faster just to switch back? But he's like, no, uh, I'm too no, weak. not yet. Yeah. He says he's too weak. And then Which, he gives okay. Piper some coaching on how to get the power to work. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm I'm guessing that they're going with the whole two week thing because like Piper's not that good at using Leo's powers because normally when he heals people when he heals people they're completely back to normal sometimes better than yeah but like but also again I'm th- I'm assuming that there's the possibility of because it was his own powers healing him it didn't well, really fix everything well the point is that white lighter powers are for other people. So he wasn't the one using it, which is why he was able to heal him at all. Right. Like, it just wouldn't work if he tried to use it on himself. But when she uses it, it's supposed to work. But either she's just not that good at using it, or they just or had to have he... an a la convenience reason. Oh, yeah. Well, it's definitely a la convenience. Well, yeah. 90% of this show is a la convenience. But sure. the other thing that I, that well, I was Well, apparently of... not for their shooting locations, because they went, well. like, to Sacramento and below L.A. Yeah, well... You know. Yep. Yep. But I I think that there was also partially the thought process there of because she's the one that healed him, as soon as he was, you know, up and, like, moving, she stopped healing him. Isn't his power supposed to work super freaking fast? Yeah, I don't know. Because you remember when he healed Max's dad? Mm-hmm. Um, it was a gunshot wound to the chest. And it took... A couple of seconds. And then the dude was up and he's like, hey, our little secret, right? Yeah? Huh? And that was it. Yeah, I guess. Whatever. It doesn't really matter. It was just, everything is all out of convenience. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, he says he's too weak. Gives some p- coaching to Piper. And that seems to work because now she can hear Daisy screaming. Yeah, and she sees her, like, through some trees. Yeah. And she recognizes the place that Daisy's being, like, pulled through. And it's uh, someplace called a Heroes Grove in Golden Gate Park. Yeah, I and looked it up. Yeah. It is a park. It was dedicated in 1919 to the memory of the people of San Francisco who gave their lives during World War I and II. Uh, small point of order. Dedicated in 1919 to World War II? Well, I think it you was... You mean, and then later to World War II. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. the way you phrase that, it sounds like someone was really prescient. <laughs> And I would worry about that, like, you didn't warn someone? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we we try and warn people about war all the time, and it doesn't seem to work, but, you know. Yeah, but no one could have predicted that shit. True. Not, not really. Like, it was a possibility, but it's not like, hey, you know, I think this asshole is going to come and, you know, save Germany out of its deepest depression ever, but in the process, create the biggest heaping bunch of anti-Semitism the world has ever seen. Oh, yeah, yeah, and six million people are going to die. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't think anyone could have predicted that. Not so much. I don't know when it was dedicated to people for World War II, but... Presumably after World War II? Yeah, I know that, but I don't know when. I didn't look that up because, you know, I only found two interesting things that I thought worth sharing, so I will tell you about them now. Yay! In one of the Redwood Groves, there is the Gold Star Mother's Rock which is an 18-ton granite boulder. It was placed in the park in 1932 as a tribute to the San Franciscans who died in World War I and bears the inscribed names of 748 men and 13 women. I have no idea how they got an 18-ton granite boulder into the park, but, you know, 
Mm-hmm. Whatever. It's a miracle. Yeah, it's a miracle. Then there's the Grove of Memory, where the Doughboy statue is. Doughboy! Is, Doughboy is a thing. Um, <laughs> I know the Pillsbury Doughboy. No. What the fuck is he called the Doughboy? The term Doughboy was oh. used in the 1840s. The origins are unclear. The most often cited explanation is that it arose yes. during the Mexican-American War I'm after observers okay. noticed U.S. infantry forces who were constantly covered with chalky dust from marching through the dry terrain of northern Mexico, giving the men the appearance of unbaked dough. Hence, they were named doughboys. Or possibly they were named because the method of cooking field rations, usually mm. doughy flour and rice concoctions, baked in the ashes of a campfire. Although this does not explain why only infantrymen received the appellation. Yeah, I... I it's <laughs> Appalachian. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah. No, no, I mean, how would you get a mountain range? Anyway. <laughs> Still another explanation involves pipe clay, a substance with the appearance of dough used by pre-Civil War soldiers to clean their white garrison belts. So, you know, there's there's many different reasons why it's called the Doughboy statue, but there you go, there's a couple of them. Don't know if I'll keep Oh, and that apparently in their uniforms look, made them look a little bit like gingerbread men. Yeah. Why is and they're like, either? not the gumdrop buttons. Anything but the gumdrop buttons. Yeah. Uh-huh. Anyway, so the Doughboy statue is a man holding a laurel wreath standing on a rock that has a plaque on it. I have no idea what's on the plaque because I could not find any descriptions of it or pictures that showed the words. The statue is made of bronze and was created by M. Earl Cummings. Any relation to E.E. E. Cummings? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. But he's got a bunch of other artworks in Golden Gate Park, and he had a son named Ramsdale. So there's that. If he goes through the Rockies, he'll be coming around the mountain. He will indeed. He'll be Cummings around the mountain. <laughs> he's Cummings around the mountain when he comes. Yeah. But he named his son Ramsdale. That's interesting. But think about that. Ramsdale Cummings. That is that is a porn name if I've ever heard one. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway. I, not as strong as Ramsey Cummings. I don't know. The Dale is a little weird. I don't like, know. Like, it sounds a little more classical than Well, Ramsdale Ramsey. Cummings is a gay porn. That's Okay, all. that's fair. Yeah. Like, <laughs> anyway. a, peri- a period gay porn. That's yes, a period piece kind of gay oh porn. Oh my gosh. Like... Like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, Jesus. Um, like a, a, a early 19-teens tycoon. It sounds like a, a tycoon looking for his, for his dough boy. He's found a nice young infantryman. Yes. I, I like this Fist period. to chin. Yes, we get it. Yes. Fist to chin sounds like a porn, too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, would be, that, that would be the Fight Club porn. Oh, God. Anyway. So... Prue is trying to get Piper to go with them to save Daisy because they need the power of three. But again, Leo has Piper's power, so it wouldn't be the power of three. So don't understand why, Mm -hmm. whatever. But it's fine because Phoebe thinks she has a better way. The way I figured out five minutes earlier. Yeah. She tells Piper to stay with Leo, tells Prue to drive, and she'll talk. They leave. And then we get... Night at Golden Gate Park. It's kind of foggy. And Alec is dragging Daisy... And he's saying something about, like, oh, I can't have you. No one will. Oh, I'm killing you. Meh, meh, meh. Yeah, it's, um, it's the talk that all bad guys do and all, all abusive relationships yeah. kind of do. Not all, but most oh, yeah. abusive relationships do. If I can't have you, no one can, you know. Yeah. So and, he, he, and he throws to the ground next to some rocks. And, and he says, rocks- wait, no, well, he has this line <laughs> that he's like, something about, like, you rejected me and now I'm the last man you'll ever see. I'm the last man you'll ever say no to, I think is what it was. Mm. Hold, please. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's like, you could have been my mate, my equal. Yeah. What? No. Fuck you. Yeah. He's like, now you made this place your deathbed. Fuck. You're the only woman I've ever loved, and now I'm the last man you'll ever leave. There okay, you go. there we go. That's what it was, yeah. I'm the last man you'll ever leave. And he throws her down, and then these jets of fire erupt yeah, on like... the big rock behind them. It was hilarious, because you could tell that they just had, like, little holes in the rock. Uh-huh. And these just little jets of flame come out. I was like, you turn the rock into Bunsen burners. Oh, oh okay. Mm-hmm. Sure, why not? Yeah, why not? And it would be, like, an occult ritual if it weren't for the fact that he's just trying to kill her. Yeah. But then anyway, his hand glows yeah, red Yeah, his hot. hand glows red as he holds it over him, and Prue and Phoebe run over. Yeah, somehow they found him super-duper quick. They knew exactly where they were. Super quick they got there. You know, just saying. Uh-huh. And they both are now wearing jackets because they're outside. 
And Prude's mm-hmm. like, let him go. And he's like, she's mine. Yeah. And so Phoebe uses Prue's power and he flies backward toward over the, fl- the flaming over rock. Over the flaming rock. Yeah. And Phoebe's like, to Prue, do, do it, it now. now. And so Prue recites the power switching spell. Yeah. So, but she, she starts reciting it. She gets the first line out and Daisy gets up and runs behind them and his hand starts to glow again. And she finishes the second line of the spell and his hand stops glowing and Prue's hand starts glowing. And, and, and he's, he's like, rightfully confused oh, yeah. by this. He goes, and she realizes, you know, yeah, his trigger is hate. And so Phoebe's like, so hate him. Yeah. She's like, no Not problem. a problem. Yeah. And tells Phoebe to bring him to her. Yeah. And, uh, Phoebe suddenly now has control of Prue's power uh-huh. and does that, like, moving thing that we kind of saw Prue do something similar to with the yeah. hemlocks and lifting Piper up. And she just kind of, like, pulls him over. Yep. And Prue just sticks her glowing hand out onto his chest and burns him to death. And he, he kind of, like, falls over because Phoebe releases him. And there's CGI skeletons. Yes. There's As his like skin CGI burns burning away. and skeleton showing. And then she recites just the first line of the spell and he's gone. Yeah. So to get her power back, she just had to say the first line of the spell, not the whole thing. That's a little weird. A la conveniency. Yeah. Just yeah, saying. So mm-hmm. Daisy is very happy that Prue got rid of him. And Prue can't believe how much hate it took to do it. And she never wants to feel like that again. And Daisy is happy to have her life back. And Phoebe's like, well, okay, when we get home, Prue, we gotta switch back. Sweetie. Yeah, she's like, she's like, you're gonna give me back my power, right? And Prue just looks at her with this, like, little goofy smirking smile. And mm-hmm. Phoebe gives a huge beaming smile. It was adorable. It was super duper cute. And then we got to an exterior establishing shot of the manor the next morning. And Leo and Piper are up in the attic against one of the eaves. Yeah, they're, like, laying on a couch. Yeah, this, like, day bed. Yeah. That's that's just, you know, up against one of the windows. And, and Piper, they're just cuddling. Yeah, they're adorably cuddling. Piper is now in a gray shirt and black pants, and Leo has just added a plaid shirt to the gray shirt he had on the night before. And I want to know where these clothes came from. He, he, probably left, leave... he probably left them there. Yeah, like, did he leave stuff at her house? Because he came in in a red shirt, a white shirt, and a tan jacket. And a floral skirt. No, no floral skirt. But, like, he had a red shirt and a white shirt, and now he's in a gray shirt with a plaid shirt. Like, where the shit is these clothes coming from? I'm telling you, he left them there. Yeah. I don't know. It was just... Yeah. Yeah. So, Piper says that, you know, she wishes she didn't have to give him back his power so he wouldn't be able to leave, and he wishes that too. Mm -hmm. And then Piper realizes that if Daisy's a white lighter to be... That Leo must have been human at some point. And he, so we get a little bit of Leo's backstory. And mm-hmm. he's like, yeah, I was born in San Francisco and I lived here until I went off to the war. And she's like, <laughs> you, you mean, mean Vietnam? Vietnam? <laughs> Which is funny. And he goes, he goes, no, no, World War II. Yeah. So, Which, like, even Vietnam would have been, like, a while ago. Yeah. But it's like, so who knows? Maybe his name is on a statue somewhere in Golden Gate Park. Oh, probably. Yeah. But so we get a little bit of exposition slash backstory. Mm-hmm. Where we learned that he was in med school, but left to enlist as a medic in the war. And the last thing he remembers was bandaging a soldier's head wound. Then he felt a sharp pain, and the next thing he knew, he was floating surrounded by white lighters. Who then subsequently offered him immortality for the chance to help special people like, like you. you. Yeah. And he never once doubted that he didn't make the right choice until, until he, he met, met Piper. Piper. Yeah. And he tells her that he'd give it up and have a mortal life again to have a family and grow old with her, which was so sweet. Piper's like, dude, is, is that, that possible? possible? Yeah. And he says that if she wants him to, he can. And so it's very City like, of Angels? Yeah, a little bit. But it was really funny because they were leaning back. And as soon as he goes, he he's like, well, if you want me to, I will. And he like sits up and it gets like all serious all yeah. of a sudden. And she says that she wants that more than anything because she doesn't want to lose him again. Which I think is very funny, because if he becomes human, there's the possibility he will die, because human. Yes, And you'll lose him forever. Uh, Again, it's very City of Angels. Yeah, it's very City of Angels. But Piper realizes that if he becomes human, he won't be able to help other witches or future white lighters, Mm -hmm. if, like, at all. Yeah. Um, And she knows how much he helped them. Exactly. So they're they're silent for a minute, and then he realizes he has to go. And they kiss, and he tells her he loves her. And then he stands up and we get a lovely view of his work boots, wherein <laughs> one pant leg is not 
quite over the top of the work boot. <laughs> and the other See, one is. I didn't is, even notice that. I, yeah, I key on that super fast. I did not And then he uh, kind of like awkwardly, you know, tucks his hands in his pockets, looks up, and disappears in orbs. Yep. White light and orbs. And then after he's gone, Piper says, I love you too. And she gets a little pouty because sad, sad Piper, Piper is, is sad. sad. Yeah. And then we cut to a construction site. A very noisy construction site that's, guess what, in front of a railroad. Yeah. Where there's a very loud train mm-hmm. going past once every, no. like, three minutes. Yeah. It was it was odd. Yeah. I um, don't know where this was, but... I mean, it's so generic, we'll never be able to pin it down. Yeah, no. But Somewhere Andy, in L.A. Andy is meeting Daryl there, and yeah. we pan out to see the two IA guys sitting, sitting in a car several, trying to hear what they're saying. Like, at least 100 yards away. Yeah, they're quite far away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Daryl says that the IA sons of bitches wanted him to wear a mic, which I just thought was very funny. And he's like, so are you wearing one? And Daryl just smiles and goes, what do you think? Which I'm assuming means he's not. It, it means he's not. Yeah. And, well, I mean, because you can see one of the cops has a shotgun mic. Yeah. And yep. so Andy's Andy wants to know if Daryl's in trouble, and he's like, mm, less, less than, than you. you. Yeah. So Daryl says Andy, he wants to believe whatever he's doing is he's, for the right well, reasons. Because he's his partner. And his he friend. is his friend. And so he wants... He and wants there were, to be there like were a couple of glances down the lips for that. Yeah, like, yeah. And he he wants to, he wants to know what the reason is for not, himself, not, not to for tell IA. IA. No. Yeah, he would never tell IA. Yeah. But then we cut to the IA guys in the car. Anderson is in the driver's seat. He has headphones on with the with the shotgun mic. Yeah. It's a really long microphone. It's pointed mm-hmm. out the window towards Andy long, and Daryl. It's directional. Yeah. It's designed exactly for this type of a situation. Yeah. But I guess Andy anticipated that meeting Daryl would have the IA guys yeah, there absolutely. with him. And so he chose the meeting spot as the noisiest possible place he could find. Mm-hmm. For the exact purpose of drowning out this conversation so they would never find out. Exactly. And And Rodriguez knew that they'd meet up. And Anderson's like, dude, I I wish wish I I could read read lips. lips. Yeah, it was kind of, it Uh was a cheesy line. Which, you know, I'm like, but you could get Andy for that. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Because we've established that Andy can read lips. But back with Andy and Daryl, Daryl wants to know who Andy's covering for. And And he tells him it's Prue. Yeah. And, and <laughs> Daryl's like, I was so hoping you were going to say that. Yeah. And then a train goes by behind them, making even more noise. And Anderson finally is just like, dude, I can't, I can't fucking hear anything. And Rodriguez, you get this shot of Rodriguez from the side. Just looking can, out the window. Like, just you don't looking see out the him. window, but you can see his eyes are red. Like, red. His sclera are completely red in this shot. And he says, oh, Andy's covering for Prue Halliwell. And Anderson turns to him and is like, how the hell did you? And then Rodriguez turns to him and you see, yes, his eyes are fucking red. Because guess what? He's a demon. Yep. Big reveal. But He's yeah. a demon. But that was that was and a then, very practical effect. They had him wear contacts. Yeah. Um, and then he, like, screams. The, like, he... Thank you, Blue. Yes. He, like, opens his mouth and there's, like, this high pitch screamy screech thing yeah. that comes out that somehow makes Anderson just kind of drop to the steering wheel. Kind, kind of like he's the Banshee or something. Yeah, like, I don't know, but I don't know if Anderson's dead. I honestly don't remember. I'm sure we'll find out he at is. some point, just he not is. in this episode. He is. Because he's, like, found out, he's found out his partner is a demon. So he must die. Yeah, but I don't know. I, yeah. I don't know. It was a little, it was a little weird. Mm. I don't know. But then we cut over to an... Exterior establishing night shot of the manor, so it's now later that night. Mm -hmm. Piper is in the attic where she finds Leo's dog tags. Which he probably wouldn't still have. No, any soldier keeps their dog tags. He died. He died. He wasn't in his body. He was given a new body. I don't think so. Okay, okay. A, he died effectively in combat. He died in the field. Chances are it was probably an explosion or something. And so... No, he and said so he's... they would have taken they would have taken the little tag off because that's what they do to identify to keep track of what bodies they have found because then they can come back later to bury them. But a he died and was given a body to do other shit in. He would probably not be able to go get his dog tags, and even if he did, he would not have a second tag because that would have been taken off for cataloging. Yeah, I don't know. Because that's, that's how they used to, well, probably still, that's how they do, you know, casualty counts a lot of times. They have 
the little tag that they take that they rip off of the big one. That's why you have the two, and one is on a tiny little chain around the big chain. I don't know. I mean, I Who could knows? be wrong, but it still is weird that he would well, have these perfectly pristine. Well, but tags. here's the thing: pristine. Here, World War II. stop. But here's the thing: they could be ones that he made up specifically. This is true. After the fact, because mm-hmm. I have made dog tags up. Mm-hmm. Like I have gotten dog tags made. Yeah. So, well, also those look like they would be from World War Two, like the style. Well, but again, I'm sure they're. Well, no, I'm saying like probably... the typical dog tags you can like get made for yourself don't look like that. Well, yeah, but I'm sure you know if you go to a reenactor site, I'm sure that they can make them the way that they looked back in that in that time period. I mean, it's the only thing that I would think of as to why they would look that way and still be pristine. Anyway, Piper finds Leo's dog tags. She puts them around her neck, saying his name as she does. And then we cut to downstairs. Prue is pouring herself some tea. She is wearing jeans. <laughs> the way you wrote this cracks me up. Because you're like, <laughs> she's pouring herself some tea wearing jeans. <laughs> like, they're two consecutive actions. No. <sighs> she's pouring herself some tea. She is wearing jeans and a pink strapless wrap top that's fastened at the back and open in like a V to show off most of her back. Mm -hmm. So you can tell she's not wearing a bra. Mm -hmm. It has a red wavy pattern at the bust and red trim at the bottom. And she also has a couple of random ribbons in her hair. Like, and I think a feather or two. Yeah, it was weird. And two different necklaces on, neither of which we've seen her wear before. Mm -hmm. And Phoebe comes in. (laughs) And she's in... A brown, slightly puffed vest Yeah, over a long sleeve top that is pink on the torso and gray at the arms, which is like the opposite of the shirt that she was wearing in the church episode. Yeah. With jeans that only go to her knees, basically. They're not short enough to be shorts, but they're not long enough to be capris. So they're Bermuda shorts. No, but they're tight. They're Bermuda shorts. But they're not, cargo pants can, like, be at the knee, but, like, Bermuda shorts, really, it's the length in between capri and short. But normally Bermuda shorts are not tight. I've had tight Bermuda shorts. That's how they were marketed, so that's what I'm gonna call it. Okay. All right. Uh Uh-huh. But (laughs) Phoebe's got, like, a bag that apparently has a couple of bottles of juice in it, and she says something about, you could draw a truck outline around this place. Yeah. And then Prue, of course, recaps the last few days, saying the weekend's almost over, they never made it to Cabo, she's never going to see Andy again, and Piper just lost the love of her life. Again. Which is funny, because at least he's back to being alive. This is true. So there's, you know, an upside. And that's what Phoebe says. She says the glass is way more than half full, because Piper saved the love of her life. Alec is long gone, Daisy's on her way back to her family, and they even managed to straighten out their powers. And then she gets two pineapples out of the fridge. Mm -hmm. Which is just one of those funny things, because you're just like, okay, random pineapples. Two pineapples and a martini mixer full of what looks like pina colada juice or whatever. Like a pina colada mix that she just pre-mixed, stuck in the fridge. Prue says that she thought Phoebe always wanted an active power, but Phoebe actually missed her premonitions. And Prue says, you know, it takes a lot of strength to see what she sees, so she'll never say that she has no vision again, which was a callback to the very first episode. Phoebe's like, I'll drink to that, and turns around to show that the pineapples (laughs) now have little umbrellas in them, and so she's, like, trying to bring, she says, well, we can't go to Cabo, so we're bringing Cabo to To us. us. Yeah. Prue, of course, reminds her that they still have some serious problems. But Phoebe just... Pokes on the big CD boom box that's yeah. sitting on the kitchen table. Yeah, and, and some reggae, reggae music, music comes out. And she's and like, she goes, problems are from Monday mornings. <laughs> and I think Prue said something like, you know, that it's going to be a really long Monday or something like that. It's yeah. kind of funny. And uh-huh. then they toast their drinks and we get another freeze yeah, they, frame before the end credits. fucking freeze frame. Yeah, this is the second what? freeze frame of them toasting drinks. Oh my god. It's very funny. It is so stupid. Yeah. I love it. But that's it. That's that episode done. Uh-huh. Right, Blue? Oh, thank you for kisses. Yes, yes, yes. So we're at our ratings portion. Mm-hmm. Have you come up with a rating? Yeah. Okay. You go first. I'm going to give it 9 out of 10 Doughboys. 9 out of 10 Doughboys. All right. 
I gave it 9 out of 10 true love's tears. Your story is way cheesier. I know. I'm I'm a weirdo. I really truly enjoyed this episode. And I'm really excited that you enjoyed it as well. Oh yeah, that this we is both one of my gave this one a 9. Long ago. Yeah. I really like this episode because not only do we get Leo's backstory. Mm-hmm. Well, a little bit. We get more later. Well, yeah, but we get, you know, at least the beginning of Leo's backstory. We also get the sisters, especially Prue and Phoebe, who had to switch powers to learn how the other one works. Mm-hmm. And they get to know each other a little better. And it's just, it's a really sweet episode. It's a really mm-hmm. good episode. And it's not a perfect episode because, you know, no episode is ever going to be a perfect episode. Eh, there might be one. I can think of only one that might possibly. I think the beginning of season four might be. I don't know. I don't remember. That first, like, that. The, I think it's two episodes. I think it's like a two episode set. I, th- I think that one's probably pretty perfect. I don't know. Just because, you know, what they had to do with the storyline. I honestly and don't how remember. how they did it. Yeah, maybe. Mm. I Like, I honestly, I don't remember. We won't get there till next year, so. Yeah. You know. But yeah, like, I, I think that there might be, like, one episode that would get, like, a 10 out of me, but I honestly don't remember, so I don't know. Mm-hmm. So now that our ratings are done, we are on to the outfits. Mm-hmm. I really liked... Crew's efficiency at the beginning with the bikini and the mm-hmm. little like sorry skirt thing and the the jean jacket that honestly could have passed for a denim shirt. Yeah. I liked that. That yeah. was nice. I liked the pink top at the end. Mm-hmm. I just thought that one was really cute. That looked Yeah, that's nice very her. indicative of future outfits she has. Mm-hmm. It was super cute. I liked it a lot. For Piper, I liked the blue top that she wore Indeed. most of the episode Indeed. a lot. And then for Phoebe, I liked the pink porthole shirt that she was wearing most of the episode. I think it's very, very interesting that I like pink shirts on other people. I don't like pink. Mm. But I like those shirts on them. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So that's us done for another week. Mm Mm-hmm. That's the, what's the word? The penultimate? Penultimate. Yes. The penultimate episode Mm -hmm. of the season. Super, super, super excited. Penultimate with a pentacle. Pentacultimate. <laughs> okay. Pentacultimate. I like it. Nice. I'm super excited for the season finale. Mm-hmm. I uh, At this point, I've already watched it because I was like, mm, might as well go on. Yeah, I, I did not. But yeah, so this is the penultimate episode. Pentacultimate. Sure. But there will be no episode next week because Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. So... The season finale episode will be on December 4th, Mm -hmm. and then we will be taking at least a week off, possibly two. Mm -hmm. Haven't figured that out yet. We'll see. Before we start season two. Season two. I'm so excited. Uh, So, social media time. We are at charmedchats.com. As always. As always. Which is where you should be listening to this from, though, yes. you know. It, feel free to listen to it from the website, but, you know, we're also up on iTunes. Just remember that if you are listening to this on iTunes, that releases usually now on Tuesdays. Yeah. You're good about scheduling that now. I am. But now that we have a better podcasting platform. platform to host our podcast, I can actually schedule it to go out, and therefore it will go out on Tuesday mornings. Mm-hmm. But, is that a store? Yes, Tuesday mornings is a store. That's what I thought. Yes. But if you would like to listen to the episode when it actually first comes out, that would be Sunday. Sunday mornings. Nine o'clock. Sharp. Central Standard Time. Central Standard Time. Which is GMT minus six. Or five? Six. It's five from the East Coast. Well, no, no, no. No, it's five from the East Coast. Because Daylight Savings. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, Because Daylight Savings. Because I think right now I want to say we're minus... Five, because they've gone into Daylight Savings. I don't think they do Daylight Savings. Yeah, they do. They do? Yeah. I didn't think every every country did that. I thought that was a weird American thing. Because not even all parts of America do that. Yeah, I'm fairly certain the UK does. I mean, granted, I know Ben Franklin was the one who came up with it, but still, like, that doesn't mean the British have to jump on ship so they would just cross the pond. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. They'd well, already when, be on the ship. Well, and then I just realized, when we're recording this, Daylight Savings hasn't happened, but by the time yeah. this is up, it will have a couple of weeks back. 
Because well, okay. America goes daylight generally, savings on November 6th. Generally, central time is GMT minus 6. Yes, That generally. might change on specific days, like yeah. daylight savings, but generally, this is what is true. Yeah, it's either minus 5 or minus 6, depending on mm-hmm. the daylight also, savings Also, daylight phases, savings but... time happens at like 1.30 in the morning here. Yeah, something like that. So, it's not going to affect most people to measure it as GMT minus 6. Anyway, to end this long tangent, Whatever. Yeah. we are also at Charmed Chats Pod on Twitter, on Twitter and, and Tumblr. Tumblr. We have an Instagram. We have a, a Snapchat. Check that in on Sunday, please. Mm-hmm. We, we have a Facebook yes. and our Patreon, mm-hmm. which are all under Charmed Chats. Yes, because podcasting ain't free, people. Yes. And I don't we... know who can make it free, but, you know, it ain't. Yeah. But anyway, if you are so inclined and so privileged as to be able to help us out just a little bit, uh, we are please feel free to contribute. Eternally grateful to, our Patreon, to those who do, and we will shout your name into the ether, and the ether will appreciate. And it. you will receive some bonus content. Yep, some delightful bonus content, mostly bloopers. Yeah, we don't actually occasional blooper. tangents. Yeah, it's usually like a tangent. We don't we don't blooper a lot. Sometimes you blooper and I call you out on it, and I'm sure you cut it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would be a blooper. Yeah, but we don't do that a lot. Or, you know, excessive laughing. Or things like this where we have to deal with the version. Yeah, like that. That's a blooper. Yeah. Anytime you finish that sentence with, God damn it, sump pump. Yeah. That's a blooper. Yep. That happens a lot lately. Yep. Like, it's really funny to me that I'm, I'm excited about winter because that means the sump pump will stop going off. Oh, thank you, Blum. Ugh. Anyway, if you want to help us out, that'd be awesome. If you want to email us any suggestions, we are charmedchats at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. We check that email usually on Saturdays. I check it sometimes Sunday mornings right before we start our episode. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's us done for another week. Mm-hmm. So uh, sleep tight and uh, don't let the warlocks bite. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Blue. He's asleep. Phoebe, Piper and Pooh, we've got evil to say and some potions to poo. So we'll see where it's at next week with Kendra and Cat on John Chance. Sad, sad Piper is sad. sad.